All right, hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is April 9th, 2023, and the watchmen were calling it again, but yet still nothing. But don't fret. Hold tight. Stay strong. We're here together, right? You can come and join us at ministryrevealed.com. Click on the link in the menu box for the forum and come and join us there. We will lift you up. We're sharing insights. We're digging into scriptures. There's birthdays. There's, there's news events. There's prayer requests. All sorts of things going on in there. So please come and feel free to join us in there. It's absolutely free. Everything on the website is free. All videos, all documents, everything is free. We have a book from Ministry Revealed that you can get for free in five different languages and a download on PDF. Or if you just so happen you want a paperback, you can always go to Amazon. And because they make it, they have a charge for it. But you don't have to pay if you don't want to. But you can get the insight there. You can dig in. You could see these revelations that we have been able to bring about here for the last five and a half years in this ministry. And it has been gangbusters. So as much as we get you know, down but not out, as much as we get bummed and disappointed when when really seriously high, weight, uh, high watch dates come, we're never out. God's already got the victory, right? The victory is already won, guys. And we have the revelation. We know we're in the 70th year. What else do we know? We know that the end of days is connected to Taurus. It is an absolute, and I'm going to remind you of something when we go uh, further into the video today, because we're going we're gonna to spend some time today looking at what it is that we've missed. What are, what are some of the things that we got away from that we knew were already truths? How about this insight? The old before the new. Do you know that that's literally in scripture, right? The, the older before the younger. You see, what, we, we've done teachings on this in relation to the wheat harvest. But, you know, when we get so involved and we're so looking at a particular time, it's so easy with all of the revelation that we have, it is so easy to not set aside, but actually just be blinded with blinders and forget about the revelations that we have. because. There was, there's a key piece in understanding the 70 years that we've been trying to grasp. And, and it's whether the, the 50 days comes before the Feast of Weeks or after the Feast of Weeks. We've been going through this now for about a year and a half, maybe two years, because we know the revelation is Taurus. We know it all the way back from what, 20, 2020, almost three years when the revelation through the Holy Ghost of Taurus being correct and that it was connected as we had understood in the revelation, 50 days, 14 years, and the 50th Jubilee. That is the end time code. So it's not like, oh, we got to disregard the, the 50 days. Absolutely not. We can show it from the discourses. We can show it from the Gospels of John into Luke into Acts. We can show it going to the story of the ark. I mean, we have it absolutely everywhere. So the question remained is, if we know where the 70 years, where the Lord God is counting from, which we, which we know, right? We know it's the Feast of Weeks. He told us it's the Feast of Weeks. It's, I mean, told us in Scripture. So in understanding that, where is the 50 days? Where are the 50 days going to be? And when we went to the creation stories and we saw that Feast of First Fruits was there in creation, and now we see that they were 50 days apart, oh my goodness, you want to talk about being excited. I was, you know, I, I always reserve my, for myself a grain of salt that I say, right? Because none of this is a thus saith the Lord. It is revelation through diligently seeking and the Spirit leading. Not saying here it is, not saying here it is, not saying here it is but understanding through revelation and the scriptures opening up from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, we can go through the entire, God, the entire book 
and show all of the typologies from the was and from the is to reveal understanding in the is to come. And that's what this ministry is about. But in discerning and in revealing the is to come, of course, connected to it is understanding, Lord, when is it going to begin? Do I believe that the Lord is going to give somebody somewhere the thus saith the Lord, this is the day? No, I don't. I've been praying about it forever. I don't even think I would get it, even though we have the revelation here. I don't even think it'll happen to me because we are diligently seeking, right? If you're watching, if you're praying, if you're diligent, you're repentant, you're seeking the Lord, you're in his word. Well, then you'll be aware of the season and the time. You see, we're, even if people don't know what we know in the revelation of the 14 years and the gospels and everything else, but they're watching and they're diligent and they're seeking. It doesn't mean they're not part of the pre-trib bride. We just have the revelation that I believe is preparing us as a portion of the worker group in the is to come. That's what I believe the difference is. So you would think in understanding these things, we had better be prepared. We had better be watching, right? It doesn't mean we can't get disappointed. It doesn't mean we can't get bummed out sometimes, right? That's going to happen. It's happened over centuries. You see, it goes all the way back to the original disciples and the apostles. They thought it was going to happen in their day, remember? And then when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, they were waiting for the Lord to come in the clouds. They were looking to Mark's discourse. You see, you remember in the time of Isaac Newton, they thought it was going to be in their day. And Isaac Newton said that he understood that there was going to be a time at the time of the end that there would be a group of men in the earth who would seek the literal translation, the literal understanding of the word. Well, I believe we're part of that group too. But it was happening in his time. It was happening 200 years ago, and it's been happening ever since. But guess what? Nobody has ever yet had the revelations that we do. They were mysteries hidden since before the foundation of the earth. We know that. That's what the scriptures told us. And if it was just one thing here or one thing there, well, I wouldn't be standing here doing this for five years. It's because it is proven over and over and over and over through hundreds and hundreds of revelations. That's why even this last video was awesome. It was awesome. It was like an overview of some of the big accounts of these things that have been revealed and just touching on parts and pieces within them. It wasn't even close to everything that we've come to reveal, but it was some of the main parts. It was awesome. And when you begin to understand these things, it's going to blow you away. And so today, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go back into these things and we're gonna remember and recall some of these things that we've shared about in the past that we have always known were part of the revelation. You see, in, in seeing this perfect count in the beginning and Christ was in the beginning first fruits and the Lord was there and we knew that it was Taurus, and now we see that they're 50 days apart and we knew that there's a 50 before the 14 years begins, well, it made complete sense. It appeared, <laughs> it appeared to make complete sense. Well, today I'm gonna go through the Feast of Weeks counts and the furthest out we would be going, knowing that this year is the 70th year. And I'm gonna remind you with a video from a, she's not a little sister anymore, it was 11 years ago, but from a little sister's video, or from, I should say from a sister's video from 11 years ago that we have been sharing here for about four years now. And it never goes away. It is always in the back of my mind. It goes away for a little bit, but it always comes back because she says something that catches her off guard when she says it because she doesn't understand it. Well, as I was pondering these things for the last couple of days, like you see, it's been a week since the last video. Obviously, when a huge watch like date like this comes and goes, I'm not just going to jump back on the horse and say, oh, this, this, that. I never do that. I never do a video unless there's something to talk about. And so I've been pondering these things 
I've been going through these things. I spent all morning and afternoon planning out this video and working through things and, and, and deleting some parts and going back and reviewing and looking over this and that. And all of these little tidbits start popping back into my mind. And guys, <laughs> they were all things we spoke about. We know there's three feasts to the Lord. We know there's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We know there's Luke, Mark, Matthew, and the Synoptic Gospels. We know it's pre, mid, post. We know it's spirit, light, flesh. It's everywhere. And yet, we got away from it. You see, we know also that the revelation of the end is called 717. We even revealed the revelation of 717. It looks like the Father's name, and it also relates to his three feasts. It's absolutely incredible. And yet, we got sidetracked. You see, because there's one thing we've always known. We're not. We've been teaching this for a long time. I've got charts on it. We're not the first fruits of the barley. We are first fruits of the wheat. We've always known that. I'm going to show you the scriptures that literally say Jesus is the first of the first fruits. And he is the first of the first fruits, being the feast of first fruits, because he's the one without leaven. And the feast of first fruits, the other one, is the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. It's Leah. It's all these things we've shared about in the past. But we're going to go into it. We're going to dig into it, even going into Daniel 9. Because Daniel 9 is a big deal as well. Because lately we've been saying, you know, is it, is it the 70 years to the end of Israel, right, with Jerusalem? Or is it really the 70 years that we're talking about right now today? And here's the thing. We know there's, there's more than one Babylon in the end of days. And I've been talking about it for a long time that, I, that maybe I would get to a video on it. But I don't, I just, I haven't spent enough time to really dig into it. But we know there's more than one. There must be more than one because the first one being the head of gold as Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to see is the evidence that Daniel 9 verse 24 about the 70 years feast of weeks is talking about this year's 70th year when you know the understanding from Leviticus 19. All right. So we're going to go into all of these things, all of these parts, all of these places. And for anybody that's new, oh, you know what? Before I say anybody that's new, let me see this. This right here, our sister, a little shout out to our sister Petra. Right here, this is Petra, this is her channel. It was her birthday yesterday. I'm not going to say how old she is because I would get smacked from the other side of the world. But it was our sister Petra's birthday yesterday, so I wanted to give a shout out to our, to our dear sister Petra and say happy birthday. And like I like to do before we really get into all the videos is go to the playlist. For anybody that's new to this ministry or newer and you haven't yet watched these videos, you, you're gonna hear things like 14 years of tribulation. You're gonna hear the open books. You're gonna hear the, the, who the gospels are speaking to. And you're gonna think, what on earth is this guy talking about? The tribulation is twice as long than the whole world has been telling us for 200 years? Yes, yes, 100% unequivocally, yes. And it's even better than that. Because what that means is, that means the tribulation, the pre-trib is gonna happen seven years earlier than where it would really be if it was only seven, you get it? But the other exciting thing is it's revealed in the gospels, all right? You're gonna to come to this playlist right here, the Revealed End Time Study Notes series. You're gonna click on this. People. And you're gonna to come to this playlist right here. There are 11 videos, but the top three right here are number one recommended to get started. The intro into the Gospels, which we call who the Gospels are speaking to. You're gonna to come to see for the first time, if you've ever dug into the Gospels, and noticed all these things that were that seemed to be contradictions from one gospel to the next. The church has told us for centuries that it's just perspective. And maybe you could say that in the is. 
But when you look at it in the revelation of the is to come to understand it, you're going to see that the Lord is speaking to three groups of people. It is the revelation of the is to come. And you're going to see that Matthew, Mark, Luke in the end of days is Luke, Mark, Matthew. The first will be last and the last will be first. You're going to see things that you would have said, man, they were definitely contradictions. The church has told me that, oh, it's just perspective when you see the differences in the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But some of the things just, they're not perspective. You can't say Luke saw a gorgeous white robe, Jesus at the cross, going to the cross. You can't say Mark saw a purple, uh, uh, Jesus was arrayed in purple in Mark and he was arrayed in scarlet in Matthew. Was it the, the sun shining on it and you couldn't really see the color differences? No, there was prophecy built into the gospels way beyond just the discourses. And you're gonna see things like that. So when you see those different colored robes, well, who wears a gorgeous white robe? The bride does. Purple and scarlet are tribulation colors. You see? So Luke is pre-trib, Mark, and Matthew are both going to be in the tribulation. Mark relates to the world, the house of Israel that has gone and mingled and mixed with the world that nobody really knows who they are anymore because they're all the Gentiles are all grafted in with them. That's why in the land of Israel right now, it's just the Jews. You see? Oh, yes, there's other people, but it's the Jews. It's the house of Judah in the land right now. It's not the house of Israel. The house of Israel is considered the world, right? The church. And they're the ones that either still aren't believing or that believe, but they're not paying attention. They're not diligent in the Lord. They're not seeking, and they're going to endure seals. And Matthew is related to the Jews, to the house of Judah. You see? And when you understand that, you're going to see things like when Jesus was on the cross. And in, in Luke, he says, Father, into your arms I commend my spirit. In Mark and Matthew, he says the same thing. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the word forsaken means leave behind. Was Jesus left behind? No, of course he wasn't. It was prophecy because the Mark group, the world, the sleeping church that aren't prepared, aren't ready, aren't watching. And those that haven't yet come in, it's not their time yet. And they're going to go through seals. And theirs is the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. And in those first seven years of seals, Matthew is the Jews and Jerusalem will have been destroyed so that the land can rest for seven years because they never, they never allowed it to rest since they've been in the land. You see? And so when the seals are over, then it's the seven years of trumpets. The great multitude rapture happens, which is the second one. It, the Luke is the pre-trib bride of Christ. And then the Matthew is when the Lord will return feet down on the Mount of Olives. And what's happened is all of these things get confused because the entire world for centuries has been taught from the viewpoint of the Gospel of Matthew and just said Mark and Luke are just little extra viewpoints for added info. It's not true. So what does that mean? It means the world, the church that is asleep, isn't going to be prepared for the time of the pre-trib escape. But that's the way the Lord planned it because pre, mid, and post are all true. And they will take place over a 14 year period plus 50 days at the beginning. The bride of Christ goes at the beginning of 50 days. The events of the 50 days take place, which is the second last video. You wanna understand what goes on there? Go watch the second last video, or I guess the third one from this one. And then the 14 years will begin. And it's seven years of seals, then seven years of trumpets. But the church and their teachings over centuries have jumbled it all up and mixed it all up. And they see 14 years smashed together and twisted around. You see, that's what's happening. And that's what you're going to begin to understand in the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. Then when you see them separated as different groups, you're going to then understand the 14 years, seven of seals, seven of trumpets. And you're going to understand the reason that it all happened is it was because of Matthew, because for centuries we've all been taught from the foundation of Matthew, unaware of who the gospels were speaking to. So anything we saw prophetically was being packed into a seven year period.
okay? From there, you can go into these other videos. You'll see that pre, mid, and post are all true. You can see the seven churches revealed. You can come to the 11th video after you understand the first three, and you're going to understand now the, the revelation of the discourses. It is going to blow your mind. It is awesome, all right? So I always like to share that before really getting going. And what you can do is those are intro videos, okay? It's a 30-minute Bible study. There's a printout that I read from. You can download it from the description box uh, in the video, right, or under the video. And you can also go to the Ministry Revealed book and read chapter one and read chapter two about the Gospels and then the 14 years to really go further and further into depth. And if you want to understand the 50 days that come first, this one will blow you away. It'll absolutely blow you away. It is, it's awesome. It's in depth and it's detailed. And these are the events that will then follow and the things that have been revealed from it in the 14 years. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And so, right as we get started, what I wanted to do next is we're, we're going to talk about, you know, what I was explaining before in 1 Corinthians 15, because there's a piece that I said we were looking at it in a different way. But what we're going to notice now is we still needed to count the Feast of Weeks. All right. So we're going to cover that. But before we do, I want to do a really big shout out. And there's a reason why I want to do it, guys. I want you guys to understand something. You see, in here in Ministry Revealed, I still have debt, okay? We still have car payments, I think $14,000, $15,000 on a car we bought four years ago used. I, we still have credit card debt, about $15,000. Yet we keep sending all of this money to help this ministry who is not only spreading the word with the gospel and scriptures with given out Bibles, to which we have helped, I believe, close to 1,800 or 2,000 Bibles since we started last fall. But our brother Steve here, who heads this ministry in Uganda, has printed ministry revealed books. They're not bound and everything else. These are printed books from a printer that they use there who gave us an incredible deal on the books. And I believe this is his team who's helping him in sharing the revelation of ministry revealed through the revelation of the is to come. Do you know why, brothers and sisters? Because most of the world does not even understand the is to come. Most of the world, most of the teachers, most of the pastors around the earth don't even touch the book of Revelation because they don't understand it. You guys know here, right? You guys know here in this ministry and in what we do and, and the thousands of us that have come to understand it and to see it, we understand how difficult it is to share it with those who think they already know. Well, guess what? Do you know what happens when you start to share it with those who know they don't yet know? You see this? They're doing events with church leaders and pastors all around Uganda. And they do not charge, brothers and sisters. They do not charge for the Bibles. They do not charge for the ministry revealed books. Look at this. They don't charge for the ministry revealed books. It's your support. It's your support. Would I like to be those debts that I have paid for? <laughs> of course I would. Who wouldn't? I'd be able to turn around and then be able to give more if I could take care of those debts. But I still have those debts that I have to deal with. But do you think that's going to stop me from giving what we have to, you know, we've got a 300 bucks left in the account? No. Because when you guys give it, we always take the portion that you allot to them and give it to them. And then I take, if there's more than what I can even need, even though I could use it to pay down debt, I don't do it. I use it and send it to these guys because of what they're doing. And you know why? They're hungry. They're hungry, guys. Why? Because they have never understood it. 
and now they're coming in to understanding. And Steve says they have printed books by the hundreds now, and they've given them all out. He's got like 20 books left, and he has to do another run, but I told him to hold off. I told him to hold off. We can get those books now. He can get them printed there for $8 now. The printer's giving him a great deal at 8 bucks a book. That's cheaper than here in, in, in North America. He's given them for eight bucks a book. But to print 100 is 800 US. I don't have a grand a week to give them. You see, I can't give four grand a month, you, uh, Canadian even. It's impossible. But that's what we're relying on you guys. We have a group of people around the world that are hungry for this. And we are not charging them. We are not charging for the Bibles, right? We are giving these things away. Why? Because there were brothers and sisters on the other side of the world who are hungry. And I don't know if it's this pastor here, but we had a Steve, our brother Steve, who you saw here earlier, who's our main guy. You see, they even printed Ministry Revealed Church for when they go do teachings with the Ministry Revealed book. He actually did a video of a pastor that they just taught in the church. And the pastor was saying, he did a video of him after, and he, had, he would have liked that this teaching went on for like three or four days instead of just a few hours. He was excited and thankful for the few hours. And the pastor said in the video that he has already started to change his teachings because everything that they've been teaching has been so high level, like just surface. And now to begin to understand the revelation, guess what they're doing? They're preparing their people. Why? To be ready to go pre-trib, to be diligently seeking, right? To be watching and praying, to be ready, to be aware of the season and time that they're in and to go help wake up others because there's nothing like coming to know and to understand that the time is near at hand to really start waking people up. Because you see, even though people are in their scriptures or they go to church, you know, they may not really be ready. They might not be watching. They might be part of the sleeping church. But when you've got a group of brothers and sisters out there who are hungry, who are feeding the, the church and waking them up, man, all I want to do is help supply that need but I can't do it on my own. And you guys have been awesome, awesome. Look at this. You see all these books? They've all been given Bibles, books, hundreds, and almost close to 2,000 Bibles throughout Uganda because of you guys. And peop, some of the poor fed, some of the poor clothed, some of the poor given blankets, and Bibles as they go about doing it. So I really want to make a call out. I know some of you are generous and some of you have been doing it. This is a call to those who can to ask that they would. I would like to just make it abundant as we make this final push in this final period before the 70 years comes to an end. That's what I'm looking for. Here, let me play this six second video. <laughs> They're excited, they're smiling, you see, because they're excited about the word, they're excited about the Lord. And guys, I know you are too, and we've got brothers and sisters on the other side of the world. You know, the, the pastor was even asking that I come and that if I were to go to Uganda, he says he wanted me to come to his church first and teach there. How awesome is that, right? I don't believe that's gonna happen. Again, there's debt, right? So I don't necessarily believe that's gonna be able to happen, but maybe it'll be the lord's time in his timing maybe that's where the my work will be in the is to come right we'll see what he has planned so with that let's get started and let's see some of these things <coughs> excuse me that are really getting us watching right that really have us on the edge of our seat this one here is a big deal this was posted this morning look at that iran kickstarts multi-front middle east war against Israel, okay? They're doing these, uh, these, these war games things, and they're now extending their reach. You guys have seen all of these, all of these missiles and everything being launched. 
in all of the fronts that are taking place right now in Israel. So for us, when we were watching this, and we've been, we've been paying attention to this in the forum, in Ministry Revealed, we've been posting about these things <clears throat> that we really thought, oh my goodness, this has got to be it. I think we're really knocking on the door and the 50 really is about to begin. But then it never happened, right? It still quite wasn't yet the time. And one of the big reasons you're going to see today is because we are not barley. We are not first fruits barley. And we got away from that understanding. We are first fruits, <coughs> excuse me, of the feast of weeks. And I'm going to show you tonight, including Daniel, the revelation and the understanding of where this 50 actually is. And it still is connected to in the beginning. Okay? In the beginning, the beginning and the beginning were both together. Taurus and the Feast of First Fruits were together. Now they're separated because the sun has gone off course by, by, um, by two months. <clears throat> so the sun's first fruits is two months earlier. But when Christ came, it's believed that he was born not at, not at uh, the time of the circuit of the sun uh, at the winter solstice, but many believe, so there's a division, right? Whether he was born at the summer solstice or the winter solstice. The church went with the winter solstice, and you could see through many other peoples that have done teachings on it, and Ivan has a teaching on it, believing that Jesus was born at the time of the summer solstice. And I believe, or at the time of the Feast of Weeks, around the time of the summer solstice, all right? <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm going to share on some of that here today in these connections, because what I'm going to do, I'm not going to show just one absolute date. I'm going to show you two and then the final possibility. So three, all right? And you're going to understand why as we get going, because all of these different parts and pieces of Revelation the, the, the Psalms in the open books and all of these things. You know, let me give you an example. For Psalms in the open books, if we just had one open book where we had chapters to years, I mean, I wouldn't think much, much of it. If we had a second book, it would have been like, okay, maybe there's something happening. And then you get a third book and we could see events going on in chapters to years. Okay, now we need to pay attention and start looking. Well, how many do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We have eleven books in the twelfth one because it's open in two ways. Actually, two of them are open in two ways. Do you, this this isn't maybe. <clears throat> this isn't a, a by chance. This is revelation. There are events within these chapters that relate to the years of events going on in the end times. So these, these aren't things that are just make belief. So if we've understood these things, then maybe there should be connections, right? <clears throat> there should be connections to them in the is to come. So let's keep going. Remember this one? God's name. The whole 717 revelation, it's something people had talked about for a long time, including us. We were trying to discern it and to, to understand it for a long time. And when you go look up 717 in the Hebrew, it's used twice. One means to gather and one means to pluck. That's like pre-trib and mid-trib connected to 717. Do you guys remember what 717 was about? The cross. The cross. Why was Christ the middle cross? You know, we even got a picture. Somebody sent it to me a couple of years ago that it looks like 717 mirrored, right? But why would Christ be the middle one on the cross? Why wasn't he the first one? Why wouldn't he be first and be the first one in order on the cross? Right? What was the purpose of him being the middle one? Well, remember, Christ was in the beginning, the beginning, right? In Taurus, in the middle, in Taurus was the beginning. 
Taurus was the beginning. And the Feast of First Fruits, Christ in Taurus was in the beginning. <clears throat> All these things you know, right? All these things you know. Remember, in the beginning means what? It's the Feast of First Fruits, 7225. So God as Taurus, Christ in the beginning as First Fruits, as the Feast of First Fruits. So when he's crucified, He's in the middle between what? The one that represents paradise on Jesus' right, our left, if we're looking at it. And then the other one that represents the flesh. So what do you have? You have an image here of pre, mid, and post. Spirit, light, and flesh. Remember, Christ, he was what? The first Adam was was a soul, right, in the flesh, and the last Adam, who is Christ, was of the Spirit from heaven? Spirit. What did he tell the guy on the cross in Luke, on his right? He told him when he had repented that what happened? He told him he would be with him in paradise. Why was this guy paradise? Why was it the guy on this side? Why wasn't it the guy on this side? Because you know what paradise represents? where the rapture group is going. The pre-trib group goes to the third heaven. The rapture group goes to paradise. And the third group is the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives, pre-mid post. What does the Feast of Weeks represent? A single day event. So out of three feasts to the Lord, like 717, the Christ is, rep is, is, is representing the first one. Because in the beginning, he was the beginning. He was spirit, remember? What does this represent? The spirit, the son, and the father. One, seven, seven. If you read it from left to right, seven, one, seven. How can, how can we show the explanation to this? Deuteronomy 16. There are three feasts to the Lord. I remember when our brother shared this with us. I can't remember which brother it was. But I remember when it was shared and it was just like a huge light bulb went off. And it was like, of course, why? Because there are three feasts to the Lord. There's the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. There's pre, mid, post. There's Luke, Mark, Matthew. And what do you have? Passover, which is what? You have Passover and then you have unleavened bread, which is seven days. You have Feast of Weeks, which is what? A one day. Then you have Feast of tabernacles which is seven days what are the feasts of the lord seven one seven hello but how is it going to play out well it's kind of like the like the comma or or the uh, uh um what's that one uh is that the yod or is this the yod i can't recall now okay it looks like seven and then comma one seven because it's going to begin one, seven, seven. Because the beginning is Taurus. The beginning is Feast of Weeks. Feast of Weeks is always in Taurus in the month of Savan. Taurus is the beginning. It's just, it goes back to even to our story. Where a lot of this began to be revealed in, in uh, Genesis 29. Right? What's the story of, of Jacob with his wives? He worked seven years, got one, then had a wedding, right? Then had a seven day wedding. Then he had to work seven more years before he can officially get the Ra uh, Rachel, who was the younger, Leah was the older. And then he worked six more years for the cattle. And at the end of those 20 years, he made a covenant with his father-in-law. And what's the picture of that? It's like this, at the end of the 20th year in the big picture, which is the same as saying at the end of the 13th year of seals and trumpets, what happens at the end? The Lord returns to fulfill the final year. And what does he start with doing? He confirms the covenant that he made at the beginning, at the end of seals to the beginning of trumpets that he made with all nations. You see? It's the story that we know. <clears throat> he worked seven 
easy years, right? The, he fulfilled seven years and they flew by like days. That's the, that's the in the beginning creation story. It's the spirit portion. It's the spirit of God with the sons of God, the co-heirs with Christ. And then Christ became light. And that's the Mark group, the light group. And then you have the Matthew group, which is the flesh. And what did, what did John tell us? It was the word in the beginning, spirit. Then he was made light and then he was made flesh. It's the story of the three creations, which we, which we have come to know very well. Okay? So, as we look in this, we saw that he served seven years. And who did he get? <clears throat> he didn't get Rachel, the one that he wanted. He ended up getting Leah. And what was he told? He says in Genesis 29, verse 26, he says, and Laban said, it must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Who is the firstborn? The oldest. Who is the younger? The youngest, obviously, right? The older and the younger, or the old and the new. These have to do with wheat. It is all about wheat, and we're going to share on this as we get going further to remind you of that teaching that we did and break this down in relation to the wheat harvests. And we know this why. Look, firstborn, right? Firstborn to the Lord. So <clears throat> what we need to do too, and what I want to do <clears throat> is this is going to lead us, of course, into um, uh, uh, Leviticus 23. And we're going to see this breakdown in Leviticus 23. We're going to see these things in, in places we used to go, like uh, uh, um, um, what was the other one? Uh, Exodus 34, 22, and so forth. But in 1 Corinthians 15, I wanted to clarify something I said in the last video. Or I should say, add to it. Because we've broken this down. We have understood it. You see, for, for centuries, We've been told it was like, what, the 12 disciples, the 12 disciples or apostles, whatever you want to call No, <clears throat> there were 12 that were of the tribes. There were those that represented like the, the 144,000. There were the apostles and there was the disciples. How do we know this? Because when he rose on the third day, he met with the 12. After that, he was seen by the larger group. So this is the Matthew group. After that, he met with the Mark group. This represents the worker portions, okay? The disciples, the apostles, the, the tribe, so forth. Then after that, he met with the apostles, which is the John group. And last of all, one born out of due time. This is the Luke group. This is the pre-trib bride of Christ. And it's those disciples who will be his worker bride, remnant bride that we call them workers, who he will inform before, right before the pre-trib escape. Because remember in, Leviticus, in uh, Luke chapter 12, he tells them to be ready when he returns from the wedding. To be ready and to be girded about when he returns, okay? So he's going to, I believe what's going to happen, I was telling this to our brother Mark the other day, he's going to inform them, whether it's by spirit, whether it's angelic, I don't know. He's going to inform those workers because guess what? We would all be expecting to go pre-trib, right? We're watching, we're praying, we're loving, we're, we're, we're repentant, we're, we're diligently seeking as Enoch. We would think that, you know, we would be prayerfully accounted worthy watching and praying to escape all these things. So imagine it happened and you had no idea. Hopefully we would know here because we would be girded about, right? Ready and watching, knowing what we know. But what about the others that maybe don't know what we know that might be workers, right? I believe the Lord will, as we read in Luke 12, inform them before, right before he takes the bride, the, the pre-trib group to go. And then he's going to the wedding, right? He, he'll, he'll, uh, he's going he's gonna to take the rapture group. Then he's going to breathe on the apostles after the pre-trib escape, right? That goes back to John chapter 20. 
don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended to my father. Boom. Then he's going to go to the father. And he came back, it said, on the same day. And he breathed on the apostles. And then he left and came back eight days later. You see, we've, we've understood these things. We've understood this order. So if this is what it was in the is that he met with these group going from top to bottom and Paul representing the bride type, we know as Luke, we know in the end of days, it goes in reverse because the last will be first and the first will be last. This was Matthew, this was Luke. So you see what I'm saying? However, what I taught on about this is that we knew that this, these two here, Matthew and Mark, were the representation of the count to the feast of weeks. Okay? This was the count to the feast of weeks. This then was the count from the beginning of the 50 days with the apostles, then to the Luke group, going into Acts and the New Testament and all that beginning. And so, knowing this, I figured that if we go in reverse, maybe what we don't need then is the count to the Feast of Weeks. So let me show you what I'm talking about in this. <clears throat> let me bring up the new calendar. Let me show you what, I'm, what I mean when I'm talking about this. I had said that maybe then what we're looking for is that if this is where the, the Feast of Weeks count begins, like the Jews do with the Omer, I was saying, well, that would be the beginning. This would be one, two, three, four, five, six, bang. Seventh Sabbath, okay? Seventh Sabbath and the 50th day, okay? That's the way I was looking at it and looking at it as a possibility. But is it really a feast of weeks count. So as we go through these things, guys, you're going to want to pause. We're going to go into some details of things. You can pause, you can rewind, make notes of it so you can come back later and rewatch. Because what ends up happening is this is Resurrection Day on the Hebrew calendar. Okay? So what ends up happening? Well, it's literally just like counting 50 days, right? 49 and then the 50th day. But we know that that's not the truth. But the reason I was looking at it as a count was because of a count of 50 days, because then the church calls it what? Pentecost. But what do we know here? We know that the Feast of Weeks is not Pentecost. We've shared it over the, over the last two, three years. We know it, especially over the last couple. <clears throat> we know it's not. It's the Feast of Weeks, then number 50 days. But because of it having played out as the seven and seven to the Feast of Weeks in this representation, and then the 50 days, I was looking at it as only being 50 days, and then the seven and seven, whoops, and then the seven and seven being as what? Seven and seven years. And when these two sevens are done, we know it's the 49 years of the seven Shemitahs and then the final Jubilee. But that doesn't mean that God isn't going to first give us his actual count of the Feast of Weeks. So what I was doing was, it was like me saying, I'm siding with, <laughs> with what the Jews have counted. 49 to the 50th day, what the church has counted in calling it Pentecost, even though I knew it wasn't, because I was saying maybe then this is the 50 counts, 50 day count from Christ to the Father's day, <clears throat> right? To the day of the Father, which is Taurus at the Feast of Weeks. But why would the Lord God suddenly change his count? You see those silly things that creep in when we're really thinking we, we were finding this count? That is not how the Feast of Weeks is counted. <clears throat> and that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to get into this. This isn't how the Feast of Weeks is counted. There are two options to the Feast of Weeks. 
the Feast of Weeks either begins the count here or it begins the count here. Or sorry, or it begins it here. You see, actually, sorry, no, that's the, that's the Sabbath after. So this is the beginning of the week, okay? You're going to see this as we get into it. So what would happen is either it would be, you see, your sixth and your seventh day. So you have your 22nd, there's one week, two weeks, third Sabbath, okay? First Sabbath, second Sabbath, third Sabbath. Remember we taught on this in the past? It's the cycles of the moon. I'm going to prove it to you as we get going. That would be the third week, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh week, seventh Sabbath, which would make this a potential of the 50th day. Is that one of the options? Yes, that is one of the options for the Feast of Weeks. However, if it's not until telling us this Sabbath and the morrow after, then this is the first week and this is the first Sabbath. This would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This would be the seventh Sabbath and this would be the 50th day. And you're going to see, as we've shared on this in the past, the 15th day of the third month, <clears throat> when it comes to reading Leviticus 23, we don't have any dates. We don't have a start date. We don't have a, a number being given for the Feast of First Fruits. And guess what? We don't have a number date being given for the Feast of Weeks. But every other Feast of the Lord, every other one of, of those in Leviticus 23, they all have the dates of the week or the day of the year. Now, do you understand why this is such a tricky thing to figure out? Why some are counting from here? Why some would say from here would be the start of the week? From here is the start of the week? There's two options. But what we're going to realize is, so first of all, some people might say, oh, well, if this is actually the count of day one of the seven Sabbaths, well, then maybe this is the Feast of First Fruits, right? And that's something that's also debated. In fact, I believe the Greeks are about one week later. Okay, so the Greeks believe that somewhere in here, I believe it's here, at least according to the Hebrew calendar, this is where the Greeks would say this is um, resurrection or this is resurrection day right here. You see? Yeah, this would, it would be one week later. So they would say this is the resurrection day. They're one week later. So even though we're here today, you could still be hopeful, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, April 14th is Resurrection Day. Because as you're going to see, as we continue to, to build this out, I do tend to lean that this is the beginning of the count for the Feast of Weeks. Ivan and I, over the years, we had discussed this as well. And one of the ways that we can look to this and the reason why we look to this is because we have scripture that tells us this date okay in the other ones we don't we don't have anything pointing to these dates right here this is just a jewish count saying those weeks and then numbering the 50th day which is why the gentiles call it or the gentile churches call it pentecost because what do they do guys they mash it together. Matthew, Mark, Luke are all the same thing, right? So they mash it all together, not realizing there is a separation. And what is the revelation of that separation? The old before the new. The winter wheat before the spring wheat. The first fruits wheat before the main harvest wheat. That is the difference. And again, What's so crazy about this? We knew it. We taught on these things many, many times. Well, now we're going to continue and we're going to bring even more clarity to these things. All right. We're going to talk about this 70 years. Okay. Let me. Okay. That's okay. 
we got to remember the understanding of the 70 years, guys. Okay? We have the, the Shemitah year chart. Okay, you see this? We know that Israel came into the land in May of 1948. But scripture in Leviticus chapter 19, I want to make sure, okay? I know we've covered this a lot, but I want to make sure it's ingrained in your heads. Because if you remember, I've already said in my belief, we have it. We have understood these pieces of scripture. When you shall come into the land, okay? When did they come into the land? In May. So we're going to call this one, okay? This one of 1948 is when they came into the land in May of 1948, okay? But does the Lord God start counting just because they came into the land a particular day? No, the Father never changes. The, the constellations have never moved. The Father is counting from Taurus. So they came into the land and it began then from Taurus to the Lord, okay? So you have from the time of the Feast of Weeks, 1948, to the time of the Feast of Weeks, 1949, is one year, okay? That's one year that has taken place. But is the Lord God calling that the first year, okay? Is the Lord God calling that the first year? Well, listen to what he says. When you shall come into the land. So they came into the land in the spring of 1948. But then he tells them, when you come into the land, that's one thing. But now you shall, and it says, and shall have planted all manner of trees. So when did they plant all manner of trees? Not until February-ish of 1949. So the first thing they had to do was come into the land. The second thing they had to do was plant trees. Okay? Then they had to plant trees. So until they came into the land and planted trees, their year hadn't started yet. Why else hadn't their year started yet? They didn't have a government, right? They had just held elections in January, and he didn't take office until March of 1949. So it wasn't until 1949 in March that you could say all of it actually began and they were officially now counted as being in the land. They were in the land, they planted all manner of trees, and they now had their government. Bang, now the year is starting, quote unquote, at Nisan. So now it's starting at Nisan. So what does it say? Three years shall the fruit thereof be uncircumcised and they can't eat it. Okay? So what are the three years? From day one of planting? That's not one year, that's the beginning. That's day one of planting. So they planted right here in the beginning of 1949. So what would be one year later from finishing planting in 1949? It would be in the beginning of 1950, right? January, February of 1950. So by Nissan, or you could say spring of 1949, which takes us right here back up now to spring of 1949, They've now begun their first year. Do you know what else happened in that first year? Do you know what else is the evidence that it began in 1949? Check this out. This is from the Israeli government website. It says, Israel was admitted to the United Nations as a full member May 11th, 1949, and has been a full democratic country with equal rights for all its citizens from its inception until today. When did they join the UN? 1949, also in the spring. You see that? So here it is, in the spring of 1949, this time of Nissan and into spring, right? They now join uh, the UN. So what happens? Now they get to early of 1950 at the New Year of Trees. And what happens at the New Year of Trees in 1950? I think in January, maybe early February. Year one, year one year of the trees having been planted 
is now fulfilled. Okay? And what did the Lord say? You can't take from these trees after the first year. Okay? So that was one year of the trees being fulfilled and one year from, from uh, uh, spring of 49 to spring of 50 is one complete year of them now officially being in the land and in fact also a part of now NATO. And in the midst of it, in the later portion of it, they fulfilled the first year of the new year of trees. Okay? So now, from the end of uh, 1950 spring, it goes up here, 1950 spring to 1951 January, February, second new year of trees is complete. By later spring of 1951, their second year is complete. Come back up here, spring of 51, and then you get to New Year of Trees. Three years, right here. Three years of trees is now complete in the New Year of Trees of 1952. Okay? And then by later spring of 1952, they have completed three years. What did it say? When you come into the land and shall have planted all manner of trees for food, it shall be, it, uh, you shall count the fruit thereof uncircumcised three years. It shall be uncircumcised unto you and you shall not eat of it. Okay? So they couldn't take from the land from one, two, three years. So that means in the third year, the third year of the trees was fulfilled in the third year. It was fulfilled in the first, in the second, and in the third. And then what does the Lord say? Then the Lord says, but in the fourth year, in the fourth year. Well, what happens when we go to the fourth year? 1952 is the end of three, so we go to the spring, right? Later spring of 1952. And... This is the fourth year, from later in the spring of 52 to 53. And what happened? In the fourth year, January, February of 1953, was the fourth year of the New Year of Trees in the fourth year. And what were they to do, the Lord said? They were to bring it to the Lord to be praised uh, to praise the Lord with all. And then what does he say? Because I've had some emails on this, and I don't want people to get sidetracked. We have understood this. It says in verse in Leviticus 19.25, it then goes on to say, In the fifth year, you shall eat of the fruit thereof. What is he saying? Now it's yours going forward. Okay? He's telling you when it's yours now to go with forward, which means we're not waiting till after the fifth year and then counting it. The entire fifth year was theirs, and within it, they can now eat the fruit thereof. So what do we get? We get, see, spring of 53. So now we come to the spring of 53 to the spring of 54, and in the midst of it, which is in the fifth year, at the new year of trees, they now get to eat the fruit thereof. So what was the fifth year? It was really their first year. Three years they couldn't take from it. The fourth year they had to give it to the Lord. In the fourth year, they gave it to the Lord. And in the fifth year, he's letting them know it was theirs. And from there forward, it's yours. <clears throat> so what happens? That's year one. 53, 1953 to 1954, about spring to spring, maybe even from Feast of Weeks to Feast of Weeks, it's where the Lord God would be counting from, right? But they offer, operate on Nissan too, right? So from spring to spring, 1953 to 1954 completed their first year. He told them it was theirs at this point, and that means going forward. So what happens? You count out 70 years. As you count out 70 years, look at this, 2022 to 2023 is what? 
the completion of the 70th year. Not maybe, right? It's not a math whiz. Just counted 70 years from when the Lord said it was theirs. It began to be theirs in the fifth year and bang, that point forward, <coughs> it's theirs. But the evidence, okay? The evidence that nothing has yet happened is what? Is evidenced by the understanding of the revelation of Daniel chapter 9 when the Lord God said 70 weeks, which means feasts of weeks are determined. Look at this. To cut off. To cut off. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. When I had gone into this even recently, and I was talking with Mike and some of the other brothers had been talking about it for a couple of years, I had bounced back, on, back and forth on it for a long time. But I'm going to show you today that it, it can't be that the 70 weeks is strictly related to Jerusalem when they captured it, even though the count to Jerusalem is at the end of 14 years, the 70 years of Jerusalem would be fulfilled. You might want to say, well, we can probably just say it is. But we have to go look at the scriptural evidence, right? But here's the good thing. If somebody says, well, no, no, remember, there might be more than one Babylon, right? In fact, there probably is more than one Babylon. There might be a way to see it that at the end of the 70th, when they come out, that the final Babylon is destroyed as well. So there is that potential of looking at it that way. But I'm going to show you what Daniel was talking about. You see, because what Daniel said about him understanding the years according to Jeremiah. Okay, it's a big deal. That, that's the key to understanding it. <clears throat> but what we also have to understand is when they got Israel in 1948, do you know they also had Jerusalem? It was separated, right? It was separated, but they still had Jerusalem. In 1967, you had the Six Day War to which they got Jerusalem back right, the other half of it, but they turned around and they gave the Temple Mount to Jordan to control. Now you can say, well, the Jews still control uh, the other half of Jerusalem now, right? They still do because they've been building on it, right? They've been encroaching, encroaching, and encroaching. But they still had, they were still what? In the land. They still had Jerusalem when they came into the land in 1948. You see, because it was the, uh, it was the British that were holding Jerusalem for the 50 years, right? And people would say, well, until they would say 50 years to 1967, but they were holding it after even, I think it was what, 1918, uh, was it 1898 or... 1888 or something like that, 1898, I think it was, when they had made this, this decree and there was this 50 years, well, uh, uh, um, uh, British were holding it, right? See, under, it was under the British mandate and they held it. But in 1948, when Jerusalem moved in, the British were no longer in control. You see, the Jews had a portion of it. So when we're looking at when they came into the land, there's no getting around this count and trying to say, well, maybe it's the fifth year and then it goes one further. It, it doesn't line up because the Lord said the fifth year was theirs. You see? So let me go back. Let's make sure I'm covering these things. Okay, so of course, yes, they got it in 1948. They got it on May 14th of 1948. Okay, 
we we showed the count so i don't actually need this calendar anymore i'm gonna delete some of these things okay we know when they came in nation and this is a thing to keep in your in your memory bank in this too is you want to recall that they joined the un also in may of 1949 okay it's going to be important to remember so when we go to Daniel chapter 9, we're seeing these 70 weeks. And we showed this understanding of the weeks many times recently, right? Because weeks can mean more than one thing, by the way, okay? It could mean the feast of weeks. It could also be an actual seven-day period. And let me show you an example of it, okay? Right here. We were sharing it earlier. Genesis 29, 27, fulfill her week. Huh, see that? Fulfill her week. So what was he doing? Right, it was the seven day wedding. So it was an actual week. And then we've got other clear cut cases like this in Exodus 34, 22 with the Feast of Weeks. Okay, and we're gonna share, we're gonna talk on those as well. So this here, is the Lord God telling us 70 feasts of weeks are determined to cutting you off? See, to make a cut off. You're going to see in this revelation here exactly what's being said. You see, he's saying this is 70 weeks. And when these 70 weeks are done, once these 70 weeks that have been determined are complete, it's cutoff time. Why? Because it's to bring in, it's to make an end of everything, to bring everything to a finish. Remember, guys, see, to make an end, to finish, to make reconciliation, it's not right away. It's this process that's going to take place over what he says next. Know, therefore, and understand. So we're to really now know something and understand it. And listen to how it starts. That from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. We're going to go into that in a moment. Okay? Seventy weeks are determined. And at those seventy weeks, a cutoff is coming. And he says, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, remember how we've talked about this many times, how the churches that do teach on prophecy just skip over this or read right through it? Do you know why? Because they can't understand why Jerusalem has to be destroyed. They don't know that Jerusalem must be destroyed and be at rest for seven years before the Lord can build on it. You see? He's not going to build on that desecrated land of his. So there's going to be a commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. Okay, that's to the Messiah. So he's telling you, when is it going to start? Seventy weeks are going to deter be determined and know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild. What does that mean? That means Israel's already been attacked. Hello. You're not going to give a, a commandment or a decree to rebuild it if it's still standing. Which means what? There's a period of time where something has happened. When? After the decree of the 70 weeks. I mean, after the 70 weeks that are determined upon them. It's this first desolation that's coming upon them. Listen to this. <clears throat> you go back into Daniel 9, verse 2. Go up further, right? And it says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood the books by the number of years. Wherefore, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, let me ask you something. Um, is Jerusalem going to be in captivity for 70 years during tribulation? No. So what are we talking about? 
What's happening? Everything is typologies, guys, right? This is why so many pastors and even uh, scholars have such a difficult time. Perry Stone talks about this a lot. <clears throat> they, they just don't get it because they don't look at the types and shadows. The typologies are, are hair pulling for them. But Ecclesiastes 1.9 tells us what was shall be, what is shall be. Meaning both was and is are typologies that'll be in the is to come. We've shared it so many times, right? How is it that things played out over thousands of years are going to play out over 14? See, 50 days and 14 years. How is that going to fit thousands of years of typologies? <clears throat> because it's going to be an intense time like no other. So we know they're not actually going into captivity for 70 years. Right? So how are they going to be in captivity for 70 years yet be in the land and desecrate the land? and It doesn't make sense. So which Babylon is Jeremiah talking about? Jeremiah said that they would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Okay? 70 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, what we need to see is where Daniel was talking about this with Jeremiah, and then go see these other places in direct relation and correlation to Jeremiah. So let's go have a look. We see in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29. Let's go have a quick look in Jeremiah 20, 29. There's some in 25 as well, okay? Jeremiah 29, verse 10. Thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years are accomplished at Babylon. That 70 years are accomplished at Babylon. If we know there's more than one Babylon, and this Babylon here is the Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar, how on earth could this one be specifically talking to the end of 70 years of Jerusalem? How could, they, how could that still happen when the Lord is coming on heavenly Mount Zion <coughs> in, at the end of the, the seals time frame and they're going to go back and they're going to rebuild the city and the streets and the temple and yet still be in Babylon? Doesn't work, does it? But what typology do we have of them being connected with Babylon for 70 years? Oh, yeah, they've been with the U.N., haven't they? They've been part of the U.N. since May of 1949. But Leviticus told us the first four years, they weren't really technically allowed the land, right? They were in it, but there were certain things that had to happen. It wasn't until the fifth year that it was theirs. So you're looking at the same thing here. So their official 70 years of being with Babylon would be when the Lord recognized them as the land, them being in it, and them being able to take from it now. So if they've been in the land now officially to the Lord for 70 years, and they've now been with the UN officially for 70 years. Is it possible that what the Lord is talking about here is when 70 years are accomplished in Babylon being the UN? Watch. I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. Okay? He's not saying they're going to be brought back instantly. Okay, remember, there, there is going to be an attack. They are going to be destroyed. They're going to be removed and taken captive. There is this typology of Babylon and this destruction coming upon them. But it's not, <coughs> excuse me, in the context of happening over a 70-year period. <coughs> excuse me, verse 11, uh, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, 
to give you an expected end. Okay? Let's go look at this word in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 29, verse 11, this is the word end. Okay? Remember the last end, the, the actual end of days end? We've taught on this word for end. It's literally about the end of days. Um, then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and you will seek and find me. And when you search for me, uh, when you search for me with all your heart, listen to this, and you will, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all nations, okay? He's going to do these things, all of these nations, all of these places where I have driven you. Well, guess what? This happens during the tribulation. So he's talking about it being at the end of days, knowing they're going to be driven out into all these nations, you see, and that it's connected to 70 years. What are these 70 years connected to? They're connected to Babylon <coughs> and Nebuchadnezzar. It's connected to Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. So let's go see where we find more information about this with Jeremiah. We must have Jeremiah in it to follow the understanding of it, all right? Watch this. We all know this one very well, right? Second Chronicles 36, there's Nebuchadnezzar, there's, right? Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And what does it say? We come down here, da -da 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 -da, and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the places with fire. <coughs> Excuse me. And them that had escaped from the sword carried, carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Who's the kingdom of Persia? Cyrus, right? The Medes and the Persians. So what we're seeing here in this 70 years of being taken away captive and led away and, and all these things that, that has a 70 year context to it isn't the same thing that was going on in our modern day. These are typologies, right? So what are we looking at? For 70 years, they've been with Babylon. All the Jews didn't go back. We know there's an attack coming <clears throat> that's still going to play out in the typology of bringing destruction upon Jerusalem as well. But if this was actually the 70 of Jerusalem going to the end of the 70 years of Jerusalem, at the end of the 14 years, then why do we read this next? Even until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Why do we read, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths? For as long as, as she laid desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill the 70 years. Do you remember what this is in Daniel? In Daniel chapter 9, we read it right here. Okay? 70 weeks. A lot of people say, oh, it's multiples of this and multiples of that. No, not in the is to come. How do you know that these 70 weeks are 70 years? Uh, how about this? He literally told us that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. He's talking about the 70 years that Jeremiah was talking about. So how do we know these are 70 weeks that are years? Because he literally called them 70 years earlier. But what are these? Why are they called weeks, though, this time? Why didn't the Lord just continue to carry on and call these years? instead of weeks just like i showed you because it represents the feast of weeks it represents the feast of weeks 
So 70 feasts of weeks are determined from when the land became yours to which you were what? Building in Jerusalem, in, 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 um, in Babylon, right? You were building, you were planting, you were building houses in Babylon, living there as if it was your place, right? Dwelling there until the 70 years are complete. And when you read up in Jeremiah, the Lord, let's go back to Second Chronicles. The Lord is going to what? Bring destruction upon Babylon and that nation. Whoa. Upon Babylon and that nation. So now the question is, where is this Babylon? Well, you're going to think Babylon, Iraq, or Iran? That doesn't really make sense, does it? Because you don't have a bunch of Jews living in Iraq and in Iran. That doesn't make any sense. Where are there a bunch of Jews <coughs> who have planted and built houses and had children and taken wives while in the land, <coughs> excuse me, in our modern day? America. How about New York? Where is the headquarters of the UN? New York. The Lord God didn't want them joining up with all the nations, <clears throat> but he knew it. It was in his word that they would. So what ends up happening? Well, it's something, again, that we've taught on in the past, but it's been a while in relation to the head of gold. America and New York and the UN being that first Babylon. You see? Because what happens when this attack comes in Israel and in Jerusalem and they're destroyed and then the land will get to rest for her Sabbaths? You see? When this happens, what happens? It'll be the first year. King Cyrus, the modern day Cyrus, will step on the stage. And he's the one that's going to make a proclamation to rebuild Jerusalem. What do we know? What have we taught on in the story of Cyrus? We've taught and shown from his history being repeated that Cyrus made a decree to rebuild. But in that decree, when he went to rebuild, the only thing he got done in the seven years was the foundation. What do we know will happen in the, in the seven years, the first, excuse me, in the first seven years of seals, what do we know is going to happen? We know that the foundation will be laid. We know it, right? We know that the foundation is going to be laid. Remember that second Kings six, I think it is, or first Kings, no, first Kings six. Watch this, right? First Kings six. In the fourth year was the foundation of the house of the Lord laid. In the 11th year, uh, the month of Bull, the eighth month, the house was finished. It took seven years to build. That's mid seals to about mid trumpets. In total, it was what? Fourth year, right? To what? The 11th year. That's 10 and a half years. That's seven years of seals, three and a half years of trumpets. Hello? And what's happening in the first half of trumpets? The Lord is there, right? Uh, uh, Melchizedek, uh, 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 as Melchizedek, high priest and king. And Zerubbabel is there, the modern day Zerubbabel. And the third temple is being rebuilt. After seals. Because just like Cyrus in the, in the was, only the foundation was he able to get laid. Just like we know is taking place during seals. The spiritual foundation is being laid by the apostles while the seals workers are out there and there's going to be a physical foundation being laid during seals. You realize what it said, right? Watch this. Uh, where is it? Second Chronicles 36, 12. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God and humbled himself not before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. 
See, this is all connected to Jeremiah. It's these 70 years that Jeremiah was talking about. And what ends up happening? The Lord God is the beginning. He is Taurus. It's at the Feast of Weeks. We're going to go into further depth in that. I'm first establishing this baseline of 70 years. Where does the 70 years end, right? We know where the Lord God is with the Feast of Weeks. And he says, bang, that's the end. Well, what was he saying in Daniel 9? He was saying that this is when everything's now going to begin. Well, what's going to begin? Including the 50. Including the 50. But that's not where he's counting his 14 years from. Do you know that? Okay. I'll get into that more in a second. I want to keep showing you some things here with Cyrus. Okay. If Cyrus is coming here, what do we know about Cyrus? Okay. He's the king of Persia. Well, when we go to Daniel <clears throat> chapter 10, look at what we read. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Okay, the whole story of three full weeks, right? And what happens? He's going against the, the Persia and look at verse 14. Daniel 10, 14. And now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, you see that? There's that word again. It's the same one from Jeremiah. I'm now going to tell you what's going to take place in the latter days. And at this point, he's talking in the third year of seals, which is probably about the two and a half year time frame. And look at what he says. He says in verse 20, Then said he, Knowest thou... Wherefore, I come unto thee, and now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia will come. Okay? This Antichrist spirit will come. Look at this. Look at what it could also mean. A place in Arabia. This is one of the reasons I believe that um, MBS may be the, the Antichrist guy, may be the 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 yeah the antichrist guy okay but we know when he when when the scene breaks out when the 14 years begins we know the antichrist spirit is here okay it's already begun the end of days has begun but he doesn't get the power to continue the 42 months until about two and a half years in to seals okay after world war three then he will get his power to continue 42 months, okay? But look at what we're seeing here. So we're seeing it's the third year of Cyrus. Cyrus is Persia. And then he's talking about Grecia coming afterwards. So let's go see what this means. If we go into Gen Daniel chapter two and we go to Nebuchadnezzar's dream, what do we find out about Nebuchadnezzar's dream? Look at this. Verse 28. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Interesting, right? And what do we see? We see the whole statue, right? And look at what we see in the statue. Look at what we see in the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Well, look at that. Right? Head of gold. Who's the head of gold? Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon. Who's the silver? It's Persia. What, what is Persia? It's, it's Persia and Media, right? Media Persia. To which you have what? Cyrus. Cyrus. So what's the first one to fall? Babylon. <laughs> Babylon is the first to fall. Then you're going to have this period of time of this modern day Persia and, the, and media and whoever the modern day Cyrus will be and this decree to go and rebuild. 
And it's only going to last for a short while because this entire depiction, this entire depiction of Nebuchadnezzar for the latter days is the picture of seals. That's why in Daniel 10, third year of Cyrus, and then what happens? Then the grease guy shows up, right? Then there's this power there. So what played out over hundreds or thousands of years is going to play out over, in this one, only six to seven years. How crazy is that, right? See, there's Greece. Then you got Rome and divided in the ten toes. This is all seals. Because when the Antichrist, <coughs> excuse me, gets his power, he's going to take control of the bear, of the leopard, of, of the lion, which is Syria. He's going to take control over it. We know that then there's the ten horns that are the typology like the ten toes. But the point is, Babylon is gone at the beginning. And so much so gone at the beginning that this Babylon attack, which is most likely New York and related because of UN, this Babylon attack has to happen during the 50 days. Do you know that? It has to happen within the 50 days. Why? Why does it have to happen during the 50 days? Because it's precisely what Daniel was telling us in Daniel 9. He understood the 70 weeks or years feast of weeks determined to which all of these things are now going to begin. And how's it going to begin? Well, know therefore and understand. So know this and understand it. That from, from, the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. Who is the one giving this decree, this commandment, this decree to rebuild? The modern day Cyrus is. Is he doing it on day one of the 50 days? No. He's doing it at about the end of the 50 days. Because Israel and Jerusalem is attacked and destroyed. So what has to happen? A decree that has to be made to allow them to go and rebuild. Which means the 70 weeks, which is where the Lord God is counting from as the Feast of Weeks, is where the Lord God is beginning everything, including the 50 days. It's the beginning of the 50 days. Do you know why it's the beginning and the beginning still? Because, where is it? Remember when we did this video and we were sharing about the beginning and the beginning, right? With Genesis 1. And I did the video about the beginning and the beginning because the beginning is Christ. And then you have God created. So in Christ, God created. So how do you know this is Christ? Because the word beginning means feast of first fruits. But Jesus is the feast of first fruits and he's with no leaven. How on earth can we be part of the feast of first fruits with no leaven? Right? We're not. Christ was. And then it says God created. So in Jesus, God created. So what do we know was the beginning? <laughs> the Father and the Son were both the beginning. And we've shared this many times. To the early Jews, Taurus was the first constellation, and that's why they named their first letter in the Hebrew alphabet Taurus, right? Aleph. It's the representation again of the cross. The one, seven, seven. The spirit, the light, the flesh, the pre-trib to the third heaven, the second group after in the seventh year, going to paradise, and the third one, the kingdom of heaven on earth. It's just like the Lord God's name. 717. That's what this story is. And what we're seeing here, where did that go? Did I, oh, there it is. And what we see in this beginning, check this out. 
somebody had shared this with me. So this is this is in Hebrew in the beginning, right? That that first verse. Look at this. See these two verses, right? See these two letters right here? Oops. So this is that first verse of Genesis from right to left in Hebrew. And these two verse, these two letters right here are what? Beginning and end. They're the Aleph and the Tav. How cool is that? In the midst of the first words of Genesis, in the midst of Genesis 1, okay? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That beginning and God, right? Jesus is the beginning and the end, right? What is the beginning of the end? Just like the Hebrew alphabet, it's the Aleph and the Tav. It's the, it's the head of Taurus and it's the cross. And right in the midst of that verse is the Aleph Tav. I thought that was pretty cool, right? They talk about it right in here. I want to share that. I thought that was pretty interesting. So when we've shared on this, when we were talking about being the beginning and the beginning, meaning it was Taurus, right? We knew that the beginning was Taurus, just like the Jews do, because the sun has gone off course by two months. We also knew that it was what else? Well, we also knew that it was Christ, the first fruits, resurrection on the third day, right? So what are they separated by now? Well, they're separated by 50 days. So if we're looking to understand from the Feast of Weeks, that that's where the Lord God is ending his 70 years. And we were believing that the 50 days had to come before that point. We were looking to be as Christ was, right? <clears throat> Being co-heirs with Christ. But there was a big issue. Because we're not the first fruits of the Feast of First Fruits. Right? We should all know this. Right? We're, we're, we're not. And we've taught on this for so long. Let me share something else before I get off track with that or start going down that path. I want to share something else just real briefly in relation to the 70. You see? These 70 years. We've shown that these 70 years and then you go to Zechariah 7, and what is, Zach, what is the book of Zechariah? The book of Zechariah is one of our chapters to years, right? Your 14 chapters for 14 years. You go to chapter 7, it says those 70 years past tense. Well, what happens when you get to the beginning of, Gen of, of chapter 14? It's the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. If you go to chapter 8, it's the Lord on heavenly Mount Zion and the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple take place. So how could it be that the 70 years are being told to us here, yet there's the 70 that would be at the end? It, it doesn't line up, right? It's telling you the 70 years are at the beginning. The other one that we have, and I'll show you a great way to understand it too. So the other piece that we have for the 70 years is our famous one with Psalms 90 and 10. The days of our years are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they're 80 years, well, that's 10 years. 71, 72, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. If you can survive the 10 years, what are they called? Tribulation, travail, sorrow, wickedness. Look at that, sorrow. Affliction, wickedness, sorrow, trouble, evil, false, idle. They're tribulation years, 10 years of tribulation. Then you have the soon, right? The soon, the short period of time, the about six months, which makes it 10 and a half years, which just like we saw in 1 Kings 6, when the temple was completed, right? It was what? The 11th year. 10 and a half years is in the 11th year. And then what? And we fly away. This isn't us. This is Judah in the middle of trumpets. When they fly in the way in the wilderness, like Revelation 12, 14, to the end of 
the final three and a half years for a total of 14 years. So if you're to believe that these 70 years are Jerusalem and not till 2037, well, guess what? We've got 14 more years before tribulation starts. <laughs> you see, no, we don't. No, we don't. I'm just saying that when you look at all of these places that we know of 70 and dig into them, this is either telling you that we have to wait until 2037 and then it begins, or what else? We know that it begins from when they came into the land in the four years and so forth. And how do we know this? Because at the end of it, the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. Right? The Lord is returning feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of, at the end of 13 years, at the start of the 14th year. So how could it be that it's starting from 70 and then 14 years? According to Zechariah, it can't. <clears throat> and even according to Daniel and Jeremiah. And the best way to understand that, the, the clearest way to understand that, that we just covered with Jeremiah and what Daniel is talking about is by coming to Second Chronicles 36. These years, see this Sabbath because it never rested? So what he's saying is the land is going to have to take its rest when they're going to be removed from the land and only a small group coming to rebuild the foundation as per Cyrus's decree. And that's why in Daniel 9.25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. Seven what? Seven years. These are all things we've understood and talked about in the past. You see? This is the 70th year. And the only thing is we were, for the longest time, we were looking that 50 days was on the other side of the Feast of Weeks. And then over the last couple of months, it was like, wow, there it is. It's on the other side of the Feast of Weeks connected to the Lord. But it can't be. Because we are the first fruits of the wheat harvest. You see? The, the 14 years, this is what I want you to grasp, really grasp in this. 70 Feasts of Weeks. So when we go into this conversation of the Feast of Weeks, you're going to see where the possibilities of these counts to the Feast of Weeks brings us. At that Feast of Weeks, you know what happens? It's the pre-trib escape. It's the Leia, winter wheat, old, firstborn, before the new, or before the younger or before the spring wheat. <clears throat> it's the middle one on the cross. It's the three feasts of the Lord. It's the middle one, the Feast of Weeks. So when, listen to what this says. <clears throat> Everything will begin at the Feast of Weeks to the Lord God, which is in Taurus. From there, there will be the 50 days to Pentecost, during which time Israel in the land and Jerusalem will be attacked and destroyed, which is going to cause a commandment to restore Jerusalem and Jerusalem and, and uh, restore the city and the streets in Jerusalem <coughs> to be rebuilt according to the decree of the modern day Cyrus who doesn't officially step on the scene until Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, is destroyed. And then look at this. I want you to pay really close attention. Because it says to know and to understand from this commandment. So after they've been destroyed, there is going to be a decree given to allow them to rebuild. Listen carefully. From, from the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be 
seven years. Then the about three and a half years, which are the first half of trumpets. And after the about three and a half years of the first half of trumpets, when Messiah is cut off, when the temple and everything has been rebuilt, Messiah is cut off. And then Satan is cast down. The people of the prince that shall come go after them with a flood like Revelation 12, uh, what, 13 or so. Unto the end of the war that he's going to make, uh, Satan with the Antichrist is going to make with the two witnesses. And when those two and a half years are over, it brings to the end of 13 years. At the end of 13 years, the Lord comes, destroys them, and renews the covenant that he made at the beginning of trumpets. When he began at the beginning of trumpets feet, uh, uh, on heavenly Mount Zion and the rebuilding began. Did you hear what I said at the beginning? When do the 14 years begin, brothers and sisters? So I had had a couple people message me. <laughs> I had had a uh, brother, Mike, uh, Mark, who had sent me a text as well and, and others. And this is the, re the, the, the revealed understanding in Daniel chapter 9. The Lord is going to begin everything on the Feast of Weeks. What is the Feast of Weeks? It's the Lord God's beginning. Jesus, who is the Feast of First Fruits, was in Taurus at the beginning. But now, as the representation in the typology of the sun, S-U-N-S-O-N, because it, the sun has gone off course, the sun is two months earlier. And he's over there at the Feast of First Fruits, now which is two months earlier. But it wasn't initially. It was the Feast of Weeks, which to us now, the Lord knowing prophetically it was going to go off, the sun was going to go off course, and the moon. Knowing that prophetically, what do you think that makes, watch this, what do you think that makes the 15th day of Sivan is what? The 49th, right? It's this, this, or not the 49th, sorry. It's the seventh Sabbath. The 16th is the 50th day. What is the 16th day of the first month? Resurrection day. What is the 16th day of the third month? The feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. But what was it in the beginning at creation? The third month, what we have now is the third month, was the first month. And the 16th day of the first month in creation was the feast of first fruits without leaven. But because it has gone off course, what is Christ? Well, watch this. Christ is Exodus 34, 22. Remember how many times we've shared on this? Exodus 34, 22. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. You see this? This is the feast of weeks, first fruits, of the wheat harvest. That's who this group is right here. 1061, Hebrew 1061. Okay? Uh, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Okay? When you come down a little bit further in verse 26, listen to what it says. The first of the first fruits of thy land shall thou bring unto the house of the Lord thy God. Look at this. Who is the first? Christ. Christ is the first of what? The first fruits, Feast of Weeks first fruits. You see, we are co heirs with Christ, but we are not the ones without leaven. We are the ones with leaven. This is the Leia. This is the Leia, old before the new. You're going to see this. I'm going to break this down. I'm going to show it all to you. But that's what we needed to understand here in Daniel. When I was talking to these guys in texts and in messages, this is what I wanted to really get across to you guys. To the Lord God, 
Taurus, in the beginning, Feast of Weeks, 16th day, right? The, the seventh Sabbath is the 15th, the 50th day, or the beginning of the 50 days, bam, is the 16th. Because in the beginning, that was the beginning. But now that it's moved, Christ is over there with the Feast of First Fruits of the Feast of First Fruits because he is the one without leaven, but we are the one at the Feast of Weeks who are as Christ in the beginning. So that it is in the beginning, in the beginning. We are literally, this is literally to uh, uh, back all the way at in the beginning of creation, this date right here, not necessarily June 5th or whatever, but in Taurus, the 16th day in the month of Taurus was the day of the first words in the beginning God created. It was this date. But God, knowing all things, of course, in advance, knew that the sun was going off course, knew that the moon would be off course. And look at what we have. Him telling us his day is when we're going. His day. Not Jesus's day. Jesus is the one without leaven. Check this out. Let's go to Leviticus 23. So, wait, you know what? We'll go to Leviticus 23 in a second. In Daniel chapter 9, that is what I, again, I know I'm coming back to it again, right? I keep getting sidetracked. So this, this is when the bride's going, guys. At the 70th Feast of Weeks, since they've been, quote unquote, with Babylon, since they came into the land and it became theirs and so forth. 70 weeks and there's the cutoff. That's, that's where everything starts. It's the beginning of the end of days, and it will start with the escape and the beginning of the 50 days. You're going to see it's now going to make complete sense going to Pentecost. Just like John into Luke, into Acts 1 and into Acts 2, it's Pentecost. It makes now complete sense. You see, because as I was saying, what I did with 1 Corinthians 15 in the previous video as we were building into this time, I just looked and said, well, if it was Feast of Weeks and then a Pentecost count, then I had said, well, let's, we don't need a, fe a Feast of Weeks count. We're just doing 50 days of Pentecost and then seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets. But that doesn't account for why the Lord God, oh, so he's going to suddenly start counting from from Feast of First Fruits and just do a 50-day count of Pentecost when that's not the actual count of what the Lord does? There still has to be an actual Feast of Weeks count. So there's an actual, so if we're going in reverse, there's a Feast of Weeks count before the 50 and the seven years of seals and the seven years of trumpets in this typology. You see, where is it all going to begin? at the Feast of Weeks, then your 50 days start with the apostles in John. You're going to see it. I'm going to show it all to you. So now let's go to Leviticus. We'll go to Leviticus chapter 23. You see, because again, so this is what you're seeing in Daniel. In Daniel 9, what you're seeing is the Lord is starting it at the Feast of Weeks. There's going to be the attacks. There's going to be the destruction. And then from the decree, seven years, about three and a half, two and a half, and one. The 14 years will begin from what? The decree to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. Hello. Do you know how many times, I'm going back to it again, I'm sorry. Do you know many times we've shared this over the years and it just hadn't fully dawned on me? 
Maybe it did in part because prior to this recent couple months, I had always looked at it after the Feast of Weeks. But the issue for me was saying, well, how could it be after the Feast of Weeks? Why isn't that where the Lord God is counting from? He is. He is. It'll all start from the Feast of Weeks for the 50 days. But that means there's been a destruction. War is broken out. Israel, Jerusalem is destroyed. And then Cyrus steps on the scene to make a decree to rebuild it. The only way you're going to make a decree to rebuild it is if it's been destroyed. And it's from the decree. It's from the decree that the 14-year count begins. How crazy is that? It didn't even dawn on me, right? That's what it is. Let's go back. Let's go in finally now into Leviticus 23. Okay. Now, there's something in following the way it's laid out too, right? Let's have a look at this. The 14th day is the Lord's Passover. Okay. So if we stick to the Hebrew calendar, why is it Jews have such a difficult time with it? I don't know. Okay, they go from evening to evening, okay? So it starts in the evening to here, evening to evening. This is how the Hebrew calendar works, right? So from evening to evening, evening of the fourth for us to the evening of the fifth. This is the Lord's Passover. Do you know that the Jews observe Passover on the 15th? I, I, I don't know why. I don't know if they don't understand their own scriptures. I don't know if it's for denial of Christ. But I know how to read. I know you guys do too. In the 14th day of the first month at evening. Okay. First day of the month. 14th day of the month, sorry. At evening. After he had the meal, what happened? Taken into the hands of sinful men, beat on and everything else, brought before, crucified, taken down from the cross before sunset at what was not only, after what was not only a high Sabbath, right? But it was actually the Sabbath. And we could prove this, okay? We can prove this. Watch this. Let's go to Luke 23. Okay. Uh, Luke 23, starting in 54. And that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on. Hello. What else needs to be said? Because the 14th day is the preparation day. He was crucified. He had to be taken down on preparation day because why? The Sabbath was at hand, which means the Sabbath was what? The 15th day. So he had to be taken down before sunset on the Sabbath. Makes sense, right? No mystery there. He had to be taken down before sunset that started here. Okay, and this is the Sabbath, the 15th day. And then when did he resurrect? Well, he was still in the grave for a little bit, right? Because he was before sunset. And then all of the 15th, the Sabbath day, and the evening of resurrection day of the 16th, and he resurrected early in the morning. The total he was in the grave, or, or the total of the whole story, is about two and a half days. Okay. He was taken into the hands of sinful men right here. Then he was crucified, killed, put in the grave before sunset. He was in the grave throughout all of the Sabbath day. And he resurrected in the morning time. The entire story is only about two and a half days. As we know, the, the three days and three nights everybody's confused with is they don't know that that's prophetic. He has not fulfilled it. They have not understood. And so when you look at this, 
and you try to follow the, the confusion that so many people have. Even the Jews, I mean, look, it says right there, the 14th day. So then look at what it says. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Now listen to this. In the first day you shall have a holy convocation and do no silver eye work. So what is the first day of the seventh? The 15th day. The 15th day. So let's count that out. There's the 15th. That's day one. They couldn't do any servile work. That was day one. That's day two, day three, day four, five, six, seven. But wait a second. This isn't a Sabbath. No, it isn't. Because the Passover un or unleavened bread week began on the Sabbath day. I just showed you it was on the Sabbath day. I just showed it to you because in Luke 23, they had to do a what? Because the Sabbath day was at hand. The Sabbath day was the 15th. And it was what? It was the beginning of unleavened bread for seven days. See? And then the seventh day is a holy convocation. So then what happens? It's a holy convocation. So what does that make? this day this is the sabbath this was a sabbath but it was also the beginning right i just proved to you this was a sabbath scripture told us and then scripture also told us from this date was also the first day of the next seven which are unleavened bread does that mean this ended on a sabbath no because this is the sabbath it's not hard to follow because why if this is a Sabbath, then that makes the 16th the first day of the week. Well, hello. When did Christ rise from the, from the grave? Early in the morning on the 16th day. And what did it call? Early in the morning on the first day of the week. So this is your Sabbath, but this was your unleavened bread. This is actually your first day of the week, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven so where's your true sabbath the 22nd done done no mystery there which means after the holy convocation of the seventh day of unleavened bread it was a sabbath and it was another day of rest because it was the sabbath day well look at what we have next we have the feast of first fruits isn't the order kind of interesting? It's always, you know, is, is it after? I mean, we know Jesus rose on the 16th early in the morning as first fruits. So when we get to the Feast of Weeks, what the Jews do is they count improperly in how they do it because they're not counting Sabbaths, but they count this as, you know, the beginning of the first week. Okay, and then Sabbath, and then second week, okay? And they did this, but as you follow, you know, if you keep doing it like that, it's wrong, you see? Because why? Because the month was created for what? For seasons and times and what? Their calendar is based off the moon, right? Yes, they use the sun as well, but it's moon, month, moon. It's Sabbath, just like Leviticus goes on to say after first fruits, what does it say? Uh, it says, from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Seven Sabbaths. You see that? Sabbaths. The Sabbaths aren't just seven and then seven and then. No, it's the moon. Okay? Look at what April's is. Here's April of 2023. Okay? Let's see where this is right here. Okay? There was your full moon. This, is, this was the Sabbath. Okay? This was the Sabbath. This is when he was in the grave. This is your first day of the week. So what would be the seventh? There's your Sabbath. 
So if you're following it, what was it based on? What is it, what's the feast based on? The moon. It's based on the moon. Him being in the grave, right? <clears throat> so what happens? What if you follow the moon phases? There was your first day of the week, right? On the seventh. So it's either from here, and this would be one, two, three. Go into May. Four, five, six, seven. Okay? Seven on the 27th. It could be the 27th to the 28th, right? Evening portion. And so that would make the 28th to the 29th in here um, uh, the, the 50th day, right? Or day one of the 50. This would be the end, the 27th into the 28th, okay? Of May, the 27th into the 28th, you see? Because it's the 8th of Savant. So this is something I'd recently gotten away from of doing the, the 8th, the 15th, 22nd, and 29th of every month. And the only reason I got away from it is because I didn't think that we necessarily needed to count the Feast of Weeks as Feast of Weeks, but just count it as a Pentecost. But why would the Lord suddenly change? The answer is he didn't. There is the Feast of Weeks count first. Because Daniel told us that's what he's counting to. So now the question is in all of this, is this the seventh Sabbath? And this then is the 50th day? Or because as we follow it and we're following these feasts, is it possible? And this is where the debate comes in. So it is either counting from here, and this is the first Sabbath, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, okay? It's either from here is the seventh Sabbath, and this is the beginning of the 50th day, right? Or day one of the 50 for Pentecost. And if it's not that, then the other debate is that it begins from the Sabbath after Passover, okay? Okay? I, like, look at this. They got eighth day of Passover. There's no such thing as the eighth day of Passover. It doesn't exist. Right? And they call it Passover. It's supposed to be unleavened bread. There is no eighth day of unleavened bread. It's just, the scriptures are clear as day in relation to it. So what do we know this is? This is the Sabbath after unleavened bread. So what the debate is, is either this is the Sabbath and this is where the count starts from. Or this is the Sabbath after unleavened bread, and this is where the count begins. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it could very well be that this is your first Sabbath. There's two, three, four, five, six, seven, which would make the 16th of Savan the feast of weeks, the feast of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Do you understand that? Do you, do you remember this connection I just made? In the beginning, when the beginning was there, when both beginnings, when the father and son were there in the beginning, it was the 16th day in Taurus. And now we're seeing the beginning in the beginning. You see, we didn't misunderstand the beginning beginning. We just under, we miss, I had misunderstood this layout of the beginning being in the beginning. And why? Because Leviticus tells us Jesus is the first fruits of the, of the first feast of first fruits, right? Uh, and you shall reap the harvest thereof. You shall bring in a sheaf of the first fruits. Look at this. This is Jesus. The beginning. Hebrews 72, 25. That's the word beginning in, in the beginning. And what does it have? Uh, da, 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 where is it? It's the one without leaven, right? 
uh, where is it accepted to you on the morrow after the Sabbath? The priest shall wave it, lamb without blemish. And watch when we get to Feast of Weeks. From tomorrow after the day, he brought in the sheaf of the wave offering seven Sabbaths, okay? Not just simple seven days of the week count. Seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto the morrow. So the day after the seventh Sabbath, shall you begin to number, right? Shall you number 50 days? We've covered this many times, okay? If it was the 50th day, it would have said 50th day, just like it did with these other days over here, okay? 15th day, 15th day. If it was only meant to be 50th, it would have said, then shall you number the 50th day. It doesn't. So what does it say to do when you shall begin to number these 50 days? It says, you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord, and you shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves and two tenth deals. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be baking, listen to this, with leaven. With leaven. Jesus didn't have leaven. We have leaven. And what are they called? They are the first fruits. You see that? The first fruits, 1061. We've been doing videos on this for four years. Jesus is the feast of first fruits, 75, 72, 25. We are the first fruits, 1061. This is why in Exodus 34, 22, Jesus said, in verse 20, or, uh, the word said in 26 that he is the first of the first fruits. He is the beginning of the first fruits. So how, if he is the beginning, how can these be also the beginning in the feast of first fruits? They're not. The feast of first fruits, brothers and sisters, is the feast of weeks. And the Feast of Weeks is not Pentecost. The Feast of Weeks is for the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Right? Man, these are all things we've taught on. These are all things we've taught on. Again, Exodus 34:22. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. So where's this year's end now, right? This is now we're going to we're going to look into a little bit more detail in a moment. So the if you remember when we've done all these teachings on this before, you see, oh yeah, this Exodus 19. So when I was showing you guys this, when we were talking about this here, I told you that this is really the one I believe is the seventh Sabbath. And then this begins the 50 days, all right? Which would be the time of the escape, which as I said, so this is what I'm jumping back to from earlier, that, this is exactly like it was in the beginning at creation, which makes complete sense because we know in the creation, this group right here, in the beginning, God created, and it's the Spirit of God that this represents the 50 days. It's a typology of the first 7,000, right, in a mystery. It's the seven days to the Lord, to him. And if we were there in time, we could have seen that it was actually 7,000 years. But... It's a short period, just like Jacob, who fulfilled seven years, but he said they flew by like days. It's like the chart that we show. There's the first seven years, but the point that's going to count are the 50 days. So it's seven years that flew by like days. It's the spirit group before the light comes on the scene, which is verse three, when Christ is made light. So isn't it fitting that in the beginning, when the beginning was in the beginning in Taurus, it was the 16th day in the month of Taurus? 
that here we would be the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest in Taurus? So now when you look at this, you got to say, well, wait a second. What evidence do we have? Now, this is clearly wrong, but what evidence do we have that this is the seventh Sabbath to this? Well, there's the possibility of the count being from the 16th of Nisan, right? But what about the 15th and then to the 16th? Well, first of all, we just covered how perfect this was in relation to the creation in Christ and Christ now being the beginning and us being the other first fruits of which he was the first of them. And he's now the feet, which is the feast of first fruits. And it's on the 16th day of the first month. And this really was the 16th day of the first month in the beginning. So if this one is so much more in line, what evidence do we have scripturally? Well, like we said, in Leviticus, you don't have a date given for the feast of first fruits or the feast of weeks. How insane is that, right? It would have been such an easier, easier time if we had known those things. But do we have evidence? Yes, we do. Exodus chapter 19. In Exodus chapter 19, a lot of people miss this. It says in verse 1, in the third month, okay? What's the third month? Sivan. In the third month, which is Sivan. To us now, right? When the children of Israel, listen to this. So in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt. So it's setting the tone. Okay, so now they're in the third month. And it's from when they left Egypt. Okay. It says, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. So if it's the third month, same day, what? What same day? Well, it's the third month, same day from when they left Egypt. When did they leave Egypt? They left Egypt on the 15th day of the first month, right? We know this because they, they did what? The Passover, right? See, the 14th day, they assembled, they did the Passover, what they have to do? Strike the doorposts and everything else, right? And eat the flesh of the roast at night and unleavened bread, right? To the 15th. And what happens? They had their shoes on and everything else, their loins girded about. And what were they to do? They had to eat unleavened bread, right? It starts telling them about eating unleavened bread. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread for this is the self same day that I brought your uh, uh, that I have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. See? So when did they leave Egypt? On the 15th day of the first month. And in fact, was that even a little bit of a clue? In verse 8, it says and they shall eat the flesh in that night, roasted with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, and eat it and eat not raw as sada uh, You shall leave nothing, it shall remain until morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, you shall burn it with fire. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste, and this is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. Okay? So from they, they did this on the 14th, and the Lord was passing through, coming to the evening time, going to the 15th, and it says, And I will smite all the firstborn of Egypt, both men and beasts, and execute judgment. Uh, blood will pass over you. Okay? Because it's a Passover. It will pass over you. And the plague shall not come upon you and destroy uh, when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep uh, it a feast to the Lord through your generations. You shall keep it a feast and an observance forever. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Okay? 
Even the first day shall you put away leaven and so forth, right? And in the first day shall be a holy convocation, seventh day. So he goes on to tell them what they're going to do. <clears throat> so what is he doing? He's bringing them out, okay? In the first month on the 14th day at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread, okay? Seven days, seven days there shall be no leaven. So we know that they left on the 15th day. They weren't waiting around with shoes until unleavened bread was over. But there's something that was taking place during those first seven days. Because what's really interesting as we're having this conversation about this, or as I'm talking about this, is we see that what follows Passover is, of course, unleavened bread. And then you had the, the Feast of First Fruits. So we're seeing this conversation. It's not like he talked about the next thing and the next thing, but he did talk about unleavened bread for seven days. And what makes that interesting is it's only if you count from after unleavened bread that you can get to the 15th day of the third month in a Feast of Weeks count. And what do we know happens after the seventh Sabbath of the Feast of Weeks? There's 50 days to, to true Pentecost, right? So the only way it could have been the third month and the same day from when they left Egypt is if they left on the 15th day, which they did, but the Lord had them with this, letting them know about unleavened bread and these things that they would do in the future. It's, it's like this period of time when they fled that when they crossed the Red Sea, it's like that period of time took the one week of unleavened bread. You see, and the Jews call it Passover week, right? Everybody calls it Passover week when it's unleavened bread. So it took them the seven days after actual Passover on the 14th to cross over. And then they had the seven weeks, the seven Sabbaths, I should say, to get to where? To get to the wilderness of Sinai. Because this says it was the third month and the same day from when they left Egypt, which means it was the 15th day of the third month. And look what happens. This is the only place in Scripture we get this clarity, guys. But a lot of people still confuse this with the same day. I, there was a video shared, and I think the pastor was saying that it was like the seventh day or the eighth day or something like that. Well, how on earth can you get the same day they left Egypt being the seventh or the eighth of any month? When we know they left on the beginning of unleavened bread, you see? So if they left on unleavened bread the 15th day and they got here, then that means the count for the Feast of Weeks didn't begin until after unleavened bread was over and from that, the, that Sabbath after, which this is how we can prove it. Because then it says, and Moses went up unto God and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, Tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Uh, I don't want to go through all of this. Uh, right here. So this is all the stuff that the Lord is telling him, right? Verse 10. And the Lord said unto Moses, so the conversation is continuing on that 15th day of the third month, and the Lord said unto Moses, go unto all the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of the people on Mount Sinai. Okay. So what are we seeing here? <clears throat> We're seeing three days. What do we know about this story after three days? Right? They, they heard the Lord. They were freaking out. They didn't want to do it anymore. And when we follow the storyline and getting the commandments and everything else, we know that Moses went up. Where is it? Um, we know that Moses went up. He's getting all the law, right? So the Lord's giving him all the law. We've shown this, this what this equals in reverse too, right? I think it's 24. So he's getting the law and everything else. 
And then he tells, the Lord tells him to gather, you know, the 70 elders. Again, it's that worker portion, right? And what ends up happening? There's seven days, okay? And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai. So you had three days, and the Lord abode on Mount Sinai in a cloud covered six days. And on the seventh day, he called unto Moses in the midst of the cloud. So you had three days. Then you have seven days. There's 10. And what happened? Moses was gone for 40 days and 40 nights. What do you have? 50 days, brothers and sisters. 50 days. Do, are the end of days 50 to Pentecost going to play out like this? No. I believe we've proven that it's going to be seven days, then the 40 days, and then the three days to, uh, to the Holy Ghost anointing of Pentecost. Okay? I think that's pretty straightforward to follow. So what do we see? We're seeing a count that brought us to the 15th day of the third month, which is a feast of weeks count with seven Sabbaths being counted after unleavened bread to start the first week and then being given a 50-day count that follows. This is what we're seeing from Leviticus. Leviticus told us, but didn't give us clarity as to when to count it from. But if we do it after unleavened bread, then we get to the 15th day of the third month. And the 16th day of the third month is when the beginning to number the 50 days begins. And that is the pre-trib escape on the 16th day of the third month, which is the time of the Lord God's day. And then, <clears throat> what do we know happens? So what we've done is we've clarified this. We've clarified 1 Corinthians 15. That's saying we do still need the Lord God's Feast of Weeks count first. And from the Lord God's Feast of Weeks count, then the escape, then the apostles and the 50-day count, then the end of seals, then to the end of trumpets. So at the end of 50 weeks, uh, at the end of the Feast of Weeks, and the bride escapes on the Lord God's day, what do we have? Well, then we have John chapter 20. So the bride is gone. The bride is gone. Don't yet touch me. I haven't yet ascended to my father. Boom, the bride is gone. Then what happens? <clears throat> he comes back on the same day at evening. He breathes on the apostles. Then he's gone. And he returns after eight days. He visits them one more time briefly. And then he goes to the Luke disciple group workers. The remnant bride who was told in Luke chapter 12 about verse 40 to remain girded about watching when he returns from the wedding. He returns from the wedding. He meets with them. And these guys, the disciples, are following him for 40 days. At the end of those 40 days, in Acts chapter 1, he's leaving. He's gone. The 40 days are over. They see him go out, and they're told by the angel, not many days from now. That's three days later. <clears throat> they make their way to Jerusalem in the upper room where the others were already with the, with the apostles and some of the others. These disciples make their way there, and now Pentecost is fully come. When Pentecost has fully come, this is <clears throat> Daniel 9 and the decree, the time of the decree, that attack and then a decree that's going to be made to restore Jerusalem. And then you have your beginning of your 14 years. So it turns out, brothers and sisters, the 14 years don't begin at the Feast of Weeks. The 50 days begin at the Feast of Weeks. The 14 years will not begin till after the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. And if you remember this, the Leah and Rachel that we were talking about, right? The old before the new. <clears throat> it's something we shared on in relation to the wheat harvest. Okay? Spring wheat is sown in the spring and harvested in the fall. 
winter wheat is sown in the fall, lives through winter, and is harvested in the summer. So it's late spring, summer, because it's connected to the Feast of Weeks. And if you remember this, we shared on this a number of times or a couple few times over the years. There are two wheat harvests that were in Israel. And they've counted them wrong. Remember what we said? Everybody always combines everything together and just says there was one. No, there are two. There is spring wheat. And the spring wheat, brothers and sisters, which is planted in the spring, okay? The spring wheat is planted in the spring. By the time it's reaching full maturity, it's late summer to fall. When winter wheat, where is winter wheat? When winter wheat, wherever it is, is planted, there it is. And when winter wheat is planted, it's planted in, we'll say this is 2022, it's planted in very late fall, okay? Maybe early winter, but very late fall. And it's harvested at the time frame of the feast of weeks late spring to early summer winter wheat is called old wheat is called firstborn old wheat like leah was and rachel is called new wheat or the younger one the old wheat when it is harvested at the time frame of the feast of weeks <coughs> It can be used right away, okay? So it was planted in late 2022, and at the Feast of Weeks, it's harvested, and that first fruits of the wheat harvest can be used right away. There's no delay to it. But then there's what? Well, then there's the younger. So what about the Rachel? Well, for Rachel, what happens? He has to serve what? Seven more years, it says, right? He gets her after the week, but he still has to serve before there's any children or anything that comes about, right? <clears throat> so what happens in relation to wheat? Well, the spring wheat, which was planted in early spring, isn't ready until late fall, early summer. But they're not back to back in the prophetic understanding of them. They're the difference between Leah and Rachel. And what happens is this spring wheat is a representation of the harvest of the great multitude in the seventh year of seals. And what's going to happen is it's going to be ready to harvest in late summer, early fall, which is what? Pentecost. It will be ready to harvest at the time of Pentecost. And when it's harvested, it's not all ready to use yet. When you read about it, <clears throat> it's the difference between Kadosh and what's the other one? Yoshan, where is it? It's Kadosh and Yoshan. Uh, harvest puzzle can I? Winter wheat, grain, old grain. Where's that other? Oh, there it is. So Kadosh and Yoshan. Okay? So Kadosh is the Leah, first fruits of the wheat harvest, the winter wheat, the old wheat planted in the winter, harvested in at the Feast of Weeks. It's called Kadosh. And it can be used right away. Okay? Uh, then you have Yoshan after the second day of Passover. Okay, where is that? <clears throat> One of these grains, Mr. Grain. So, here it is. Is forbidden Kadosh grain. So, I, what you find out is that the, the winter wheat the Leia wheat, the first fruits of the wheat harvest that is harvested at the time of the Feast of Weeks, can be used right away. 
it is called old wheat. It is considered old wheat. You see that? It's considered old wheat. The spring wheat, when it is harvested at the time of Pentecost, is called new wheat or new grain. And when it is harvested, okay, when the rapture for that time comes, it takes where it cannot be used, okay? So it's like the Lord. Think of it this way. When the Lord returns at the end of the six years of seals, okay, and the 14 years begins at the time around true Pentecost, uh, uh, yeah, true Pentecost, and you have the six years come. When the six years of seals are over and it's around the time frame of Pentecost from when the 14 years started, then it's the time of the harvest of the new wheat. But the new wheat cannot be used until the second day of Passover the following year. Until once the second day of Passover in the following year comes, it's now considered old grain and it can now be used. This is why, and we've taught on this in the past, this is why in, in Ezekiel 39 that everybody talks about, the Ezekiel 39 war, it says that for seven months, they're going to be burying them and cleansing the land. Because after the Ezekiel 39 war, and you get to Revelation 7, the 144,000 are sealed, and then you have the rapture of the great multitude, it's about six months into the seventh year. Even though the Lord came the year before at about Pentecost after six years of seals, and they're being brought in, their time of when it's all brought in, when the complete rapture is done and they can go in, will take about seven months. And that seven months would bring them to what? You guessed it. Passover of that seventh year of seals. You see that? This is something we have taught on. This is something we have known. But for some stupid reason, I ended up getting away from it because of this connection and seeing this connection to the 50 days first and looking at beginning and beginning. But we have always been the first fruits of the wheat harvest, which is the Feast of Weeks. So if this is the 70th year, get ready, brothers and sisters, because these are our options. The bride of Christ <clears throat> is either going here, if it's counted from the beginning, but we have nothing biblical outside of maybe trying to understand that count in Leviticus. We have nothing that points to the eighth, ninth of the third month. What we do have is the Exodus story, which began from the 15th of Sivan in the, or the beginning of the first month and took us to the seventh Sabbath, when they came into the land, right, into the wilderness of Sinai. <clears throat> and then what happened? There was a 50-day story count that began. You following? I personally heavily lean to this being the beginning of the 50 days and the escape of the bride of Christ. However, I don't know how long I've been going, but I'm going to bring this to an end with this. There is still one more possibility, <clears throat> and that is this. What if, as we know, what if, as we know, the moon comes out 10 days too early? What if the moon comes out 10 days too early? If the moon comes out 10 days too early, <clears throat> then the 15th of Sivan isn't really here. The 15th of Sivan would be June 14th. All right? So everything is off by 10 days, right? It would mean the 15th of Sivan is really where the Hebrew calendar has the 25th of Sivan. Is the moon really here? 
Were the Sabbaths really where they are because the moon is there? Yes. Yes, definitely they are. The Hebrew calendar has it in the right place, okay? This is where they are. However, we know of Apocrypha that tells us, just as we know for a fact that the moon is off by two months, the sun is off by two months, we know that the moon is also off by 10 days. And if we have apocryphal scripture that says it's off by 10 days, then the seventh Sabbath or the 15th of Savan would actually be the 25th of Savan on the Hebrew calendar or June 14th, making the 14th into the 15th, the beginning of 50 days. Okay, it just means everything is off by 10 days in where the true count of these events should be. So all you do is just push everything back 10 days, okay? If that's the case, then look at what we have. June 14th, which is what? 614. And then you would have what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven days. And what does it equal? The circuit of the sun. The summer solstice. The summer solstice would begin at what in Jerusalem? The eighth day. <clears throat> the eighth day would be June 22nd or 622 on the Gregorian calendar. Why am I making a point of this? Why is this kind of interesting? Well, I'm going to show you. Remember Exodus 3422. I want you to see this. Exodus 3422. If you remember what it says, thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering. Okay, look at this. 614. Remember we did a talk on this a year or two ago? 614, like what? Like June 14th? Maybe? Maybe? And what's it called? For gathering in of crops. For the gathering in of crops. Do you remember what we said about 717? Watch this. Look at this for 717. Okay? The end time code revealed of 717, which is what? 717, which is to gather and pluck. Why? The one is the gather. The seven is the pluck. And the other seven is the Lord returning, feet down on the Mount of Olives. Remember, 717 is 177. It's like Passover, Feast of Weeks, uh, Tabernacles. But it will begin with one and then be seven and then seven. The first one is a gather, the second one is the plucking. This is why even when we go to Genesis, uh, 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 Genesis chapter 8, you see the 40 days in the typology of the 40 days of the Son of Man. Then the Antichrist spirit, the dove, the 50 days come to an end. And then you got seven years as seven days. And what happens after? Plucked. Right? To pluck off. It's the rapture. The rapture is represented by the pluck. So when we see this in Exodus 34, <coughs> 22, it's really interesting because this is something we taught on. This gathering in, 614. Well, look at the word that it comes from. It comes from the Hebrew word 622, which is the eighth day. And this is the Lord talking about remove, reward. Well, look at what it equals this year. If, do you know that every year, the 15th of Savan doesn't equal 10 days later to the 14th of June? Let me just give you one simple example, okay? I know it's obvious, but let me just give you one simple example. Let's go to June. Here's the 15th of Savan in 2022. You see why we spoke about it in 2022? <laughs> right? 614 and it was the 15th of Savan? That made it very exciting potentially for us last year, right? So you see, but if it's 10 days off, then it would be where? Over here. 
Well, it was past the circuit of the sun last year. And why does that matter? Because if it's 10 days off, this is exactly seven days and the Lord returning on the eighth day at the circuit of the sun. Remember, if Messiah Jesus is born at the circuit of the sun, what was the story in Luke in order? It was the birth of John the Baptist until what? Until the eighth day, right? Uh, open his mouth the eighth day. So he was born and then the eighth day. And then we go in Luke in order. And this all relates to the escape. And then the Lord coming after seven days on the eighth day. And when he comes, he's coming, look, he's coming to what? He's coming as being born in the typology of 40 days of his birth to the 40 days of the Son of Man. So what do you have? After seven days to the eighth, and it's related to his birth at the what? At the circuit of the sun? Is it possible that Jesus is born at the time frame of the Feast of Weeks at the circuit of the sun? If it's 10 days off, and we're counting here in the 10 days off, then there's the uh, seventh Sabbath, there's the beginning of the 50, there's your seven days, and there's the Lord beginning, coming on the eighth day to start his 40 days. It lines up with Luke in order. It lines up with the 50 days following being Pentecost, <coughs> of which the eight of the Lord, right, or the eight from the escape, and the 50 day count going to Pentecost, which is after the Feast of Weeks, it lines up with, uh, where are you? With Isaiah, one of our other famous ones we go to, which tell us what? There's a light affliction that's coming to them first. And then for unto us, a child is born. It's the son of man coming for 40 days. And then the big affliction, which is Syria. And what do we know it starts with? It's going to start with an attack on Israel. And now we know also sometime within here, there's going to be attack on the first Babylon. What else do we know is going to happen within this time frame? Well, we believe there's going to be a stone's throw. And this stone's throw is relation to the first eight days related to the apostles, related to Ephesus. And it would be somewhere in this first week. Well, let me show you something as a fun side note. You guys remember this? You guys will remember this. Where is it? Remember the movie Don't Look Up? Everybody was talking about it, right, in, uh, a couple of years ago? Well, the movie, Don't Look Up, was all about a comet, right, or meteor, whatever it was, coming and was going to destroy the Earth. This entire thing, Don't Look Up, was a mockery of the Lord's Word in Luke's discourse. That tells us, starting in verse 25, right? Sun, moon, and stars, the stress of nations, men's hearts, men's hearts, men's hearts, failing them for fear of looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. And what does it say? Verse 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up. This is all about meteors coming to the earth. We've shared on it many times. And this was a mockery about it. It was first released on December 5th, was the first release of it in 2021. In the movie, they say that this giant meteor, right? DiCaprio says that it's coming to the earth in, listen to this, precisely six months and 14 days. That's kind of interesting too, isn't it? Six month, 14th day. But it, it's better than that. Because if we count from the release of the movie December 5th, now that was in 2021, but we're counting as if, what were they trying to tell us if the enemy is trying to tell us something within the movies or hiding something because it has to be made known or the Lord is using it to inform those who are watching? Because remember, we spoke about this last year. 
Why couldn't it still be applicable if it's don't look up and we know we're to look up when this happens? So if we take 2022 from December 5th and we add six months and 14 days, we get to June 19th, 2023. And what would June 19th beat 2023 be? In the midst of the week. This is exactly what we teach. We teach that the stone's throw is going to land in the midst of the first week because it is directly related to the church of Ephesus, which begins the 50 days after the escape when the Lord anoints the apostles when he blows on them. And it starts and it's represented by that first week before the Lord returns to begin his 40 days and meet with the Smyrna group. Ephesus has the idolatry of the, of, the, of the goddess Diana that was created by a meteor that struck in Ephesus. And this is the representation of the first week for which we know a stone's throw is coming. And we've got an enemy mocking us, mocking the Lord saying, don't look up right in the midst of the week that we know is to look up. But if you remember from this, I don't believe this to look up is represented as the Lord telling everybody to look up because the pre-trib is already gone. This is his warning to his remnant bride to look up and know that it's all about to begin. This is the stone's throw that we've been talking about. It may be seen before, but it's going to hit sometime in the midst of that first week of the 50 days. Now, is it possible this is where we're looking from the true 15th and 16th of Savan? Absolutely. But is it also possible that it's 15 days later, uh, 10 days later, because we have revelation of it, the moon being 10 days off. Is it possible? It absolutely is. And we have a, a, a mockery with the stone's throw, don't look up. And we have the son of man being born at the time of the circuit of the sun. And as I bring this to a close, why is it important for us to consider the circuit of the sun? One, because that's what it told us even in Exodus 34, 22, told us the same thing. I keep going click back. I don't remember how far back it was. <laughs> Exodus 34, 22, at the year's end. And what was it? Connected to the circuit of the sun. Well, where did that lead us to? Remember this? This is why I brought it up earlier. Our chapters to years. If it was one or two, it would be no big deal. But it's 10 in, it, it, sorry, it's 12 in 10 different books. It is not by chance. It is not a mistake. So when we go to the book of Psalms and we go and we know that 18 is connected to the first week, which we know is craziness and a stone's throw and all of the chaos happening during the first week while the wedding is taking place in heaven. Does it make sense that, look at this, go read Psalms 18 and see all the craziness happening. This is all taking place during that first week while the wedding is taking place in heaven. Do you see? Now he's going to reward those workers that remain. He's going to deliver them and reward them. And then look what happens. Psalms 19, check this out. Starting in verse, uh, let's start in verse two. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words unto the end of the world. Okay, it's talking about the sun, moon, and stars, right? The, the constellations, the movement. That's what we're talking about. The constellations, Taurus is the beginning. In them hath he set the tabernacle for the sun. Okay, for the sun. Now listen to this, which is as a bridegroom. Who's as a bridegroom? The sun, which is as a bridegroom 
coming out of his chamber, rejoicing as a strong man ready to run a race. Why do, what do you think that means? He just got married. He was just with his bride. And now he's coming ready to run the race. And look at what it says. His going forth is from one end of heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. Circuit of the sun. If Christ is truly born at the time frame of the Feast of Weeks when he came in the flesh and it was the time of the circuit of the sun, in Psalms 19 is telling us he's coming at the time of the circuit of the sun and the Feast of Weeks and that group remnant at that gathering dinner that's going to take place for them after the wedding is the circuit of the sun. And we have apocryphas telling us that the moon is off by 10 days. What do you think the chances are that the possibility of it being 10 days off? So what I am telling you here tonight, right now, brothers and sisters, is that the escape of the bride of Christ is anywhere from here to here to at the very latest right here. What does that mean? About two more months about two more months does it suck yes but you see i can't even say like the greeks were saying you know they've got it about one week later because i've just shown to you these things that we already knew beforehand these things we already knew we know we're not the first fruits of the feast of first fruits we are the feast of first fruits of the feast of weeks of the wheat harvest. That is Leah, brothers and sisters. And the exciting thing is now we can understand it. Because the Lord God is saying, bang, this is where it starts. And I almost forgot the juiciest part. Because you remember the video that I was talking about that we've shared a few times over the years. This at the time, young sister of ours back in 2012, almost 11 years ago now. Do you guys remember what she said? When I was pondering these things this afternoon and all of this stuff started connecting and I was reminded of all these parts and pieces right towards the end, later in the afternoon, she came back into my spirit again. The, her, her, the, her video and what she said came right back and I said, oh my goodness. And I went from, I was so frazzled because I was going through so many things in my mind and piecing it all together. I had to go inside and take a break and just chill out with my wife, grab a bite to eat, and then came back into the garage, was studying some more, and bam, she popped into my mind again. Okay? Listen, because this is why. A lot of people were gathering us. There was a chain reaction of that phrase, blessed be the name of the Lord. And then I heard a trumpet sound. And then there were angels in the sky, and everyone was just pristine and clear and beautiful, and there was white robes, and it was super clean, and I think Jesus was there in the middle of the street. And then, um, yeah, I heard a trumpet sound, and I heard other, I think, other instruments, and it was just jubilation, and, we were, and I just remember, like, screaming and jumping up and down in joy. I was, like, extremely happy. I never knew that I could be that happy on earth. Like, I was super happy. And I was like, oh, this is it, this is it, this is the rapture, this is the rapture. God, is, Jesus is here, he's coming, we're going to go. And uh, we stayed um, for just a few. I'm going to tell you why. We're staying and we're rejoicing. And we're just saying, blessed be the name of the Lord. And everyone was just happy and stuff. And um, I, we were celebrating because we were celebrating like it was God's birthday. And that's right. All right. I'm going to continue to play the rest a little bit further. But she had an incredible rapture dream. And she talks all about it. And then she says, they were all, they were, they were in white everywhere. Every, there was jubilation. She never thought she could feel this much excitement on the earth in physical flesh. It was so exciting. She knew it was the rapture. But then they're like, what are we still doing here? But she knew, she said that it was God the Father's birthday or something like that. And you can see she's confused. Well, listen to what she says next. Because Jesus was there and her, and her friend went to go talk to Jesus and listen to what Jesus told him. I remember that's one purpose that we were celebrating. And um, towards the end of the dream, someone said, um, went to Jesus in the middle of the street. 
and he asked them, um, when are we leaving? And he said, right after we finish celebrating God, my father, or something like that. And I was like, ooh. See, <laughs> she says, so they knew it, but the reason they hadn't gone yet was because it was a celebration for God the Father's birthday. And you could see just before she's like, ooh, yeah. She, she was like confused because her friend goes to talk to Jesus and Jesus tells the friend that we're going after we, cele we finish celebrating my father's birthday. What? You can see why at first she's like, God, my father's birthday, you know, or something like that. Why did she say, or something like, because it's confusing. God the Father has no beginning and has no end. How on earth can it be the Father's birthday? There, 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 there is no birth, right? He's always been. So there is no beginning. There is no end to the Father. But you know what there is, brothers and sisters? You guessed it. You already know what I'm going to tell you. If I can find the picture. Taurus. Taurus is the Father's beginning. The son has moved to the first fruits of the feast of first fruits, but he was in Taurus, which is now the feast of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, because the two are first fruits, and Jesus was the first of the first fruits. Taurus has never changed. The constellations have never gone out of place. They have never changed. They have never moved, because the Father never changes. And the reason she was confused, the reason she couldn't understand it is because it was the father. Who on earth knows any connection to something that would be the father's? That means his birthday, his anniversary, his time of celebration. What on earth could it possibly be? Well, now you know what it is, brothers and sisters. It is the first fruits of the feast of weeks of the wheat harvest, which was the beginning resurrection day in the beginning you see because the lord god is counting the feasts of weeks my friends there is no more confusion this is the 70th year we are the leia old wheat winter wheat that goes first that needs no time in between it is the first fruits, Leah, wheat harvest, Gentile bride of Christ, and remnant workers here with them for the 40 days. Whether it's earlier June or whether it's to the time of the 14th to the 22nd, brothers and sisters, this is it. We are first fruits of the feast of first fruits, period. It's done, signed, sealed, and delivered. There will be no more need to look at any other times throughout the year, because guess what? It had always had to have been connected to Taurus, either 50 to Taurus or Taurus then 50. Now we've got it, now we've understood. The revelation, my friends, was Daniel chapter nine, 70 weeks, which is the Lord's Father's celebration at the escape in the beginning of the 50 days, the destruction and the devastations that take place along the way and at the commandment to restore will begin the seven weeks, which I believe will be the time frame of Pentecost 50 days later. Brothers and sisters, God bless you. I love you. And please, if you can help us with these last two months, if you have the ability, pour it out and let us bless these people. Let's make a great impact in these last two months. I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. And for those of you who aren't sure how to do it, you can support the ministry right here from GoFundMe. You can support us right here in PayPal, or you can go in the description box under the video you're already watching, go into the description box. And if somebody wants to mail something, you can mail it. This is the mailing info right here. I am not a 501c3, so there is no tax deduction thing. If somebody sends in large donation, it is for the Lord. There is no business. I'm a dude in his garage 
that is revealing the revelation of the Lord. So if that's another way you want to do it, this is the information for it as well. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. I love you. God bless you. I pray this blesses you. Continue to diligently seek and search. Study this video. Understand it. And brothers and sisters, we will be ready as Enoch was diligently seeking for when he comes. God bless you. God bless your families. Bye for now.